for uh, attending this uh, converse after lunch conversation. Uh, my name is Cristian Pervulescu. We have three very distinguished guests as panelists today, both from personal perspective, but also from the perspective of the companies uh, they, uh, they represent. I would have the kind request to support me in moderating this, uh, this conversation by uh, asking questions and actively participate uh, to our debate. Um, just allow me to uh, introduce um, our panelists today. Um, Alessio Menegazzo from Enel, uh, Ms. Corina Popescu, Electrica, and our guest Mehmet Oguscu from, from all over the world, let's say. Um, we have a very nice and interesting topic among all these strategic and geostrategic uh, discussions of today. And the topic is one that uh, is one of the tipping point or the center uh, uh, stones in all the discussions uh, regarding geopolitics. And we will speak a little bit about energy. And not in general terms, but uh, in something that we are calling today energy transition. Uh, we are changing some rules of the game and uh, we are constantly changing maybe the technology and uh, we are constantly changing the regulations. Um, from what we are transiting and where is actually uh, where the, this road takes us. Mehmet. What are the game changers that we are speaking about? That's a very good question, actually. Game changers has been used, misused, abused uh, for many things. But I think for energy, when you talk about game changers, there are really changes which fundamentally will affect the way our energy world will be operating. I think the number one game changer is uh, abundance of energy. Although still, Almost one billion people have no access to commercial energy in our world, scarcity of energy. But when you look at the markets, there is abundance of oil, abundance of coal, natural gas, nuclear, and now renewables, over cap excess capacities. And so whether this will continue the way it is, we have to see. This is a new development. Secondly is the another revolution, renewable revolution, rise of revolution, the rise of renewables. And when I used to work for IEA back in 1990s, we said, well, of course, renewable is important, but it's only 3 4% of the world energy mix. And the rest will be, in our foreseeable future, fossil fuels, hydrocarbons. It was true at that time, but we never ad admitted then that the rapidity of changes will rock the system. And now, almost half of electricity is produced in the UK and Germany by renewables. Jordan, 98% hydrocarbon dependent economy. Now they are producing for 3 cents per kilowatt hour photovoltaic solar energy. In Turkey, increasing amount of renewables, not only in uh, uh, wind and solar energy, but also geothermal and hydraulic. So the renewable revolution is there and will continue at a pace which we never anticipated. So this is going to change the game. Again, related to that is the technology that you mentioned, but not only as a blessing to make our lives easier, efficient, blah, 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 but also as a disruptive force, because it's changing for, so fast. Where am I going to invest as a uh, businessman? <laughs> Which technology is changing every eight months? Before, in the energy industry, we always talk about you know, long lead times, 20 years, 25 years. Things are happening now in three months, eight months. You can't keep up with that. So you have to be well prepared for all these you know, quick uh, changes. The government systems are not uh, adapted fast enough to that. Companies are very slow. The boardrooms still hesitate what to do. And some of the companies, like Statoil, changed the name from oil to Equinor, another name. So, we will not talk about oil, gas company, coal company, or utility. We'll talk about energy company, 
which will not include only the traditional energy groups, but also information technology companies like Google, like Huawei that we discussed, or transportation companies. Can be there any Google in energy? Sorry? Can be any Google type of uh, uh, company in energy? Yes. I mean, some people, some people in a garage inventing a technology and a lot of investors throwing their crazy venture capital in their startups? We will see that kind of companies. Small is beautiful, as Schumpeter used to say. And this large-scale, gigantic elephant uh, companies will be a matter of past. And uh, we, will we are seeing already examples in the US. Most of the shale gas and oil companies are small to medium-sized, very flexible and agile. The other game changer is climate change. We always pay lip service to it. Kyoto Protocol and Paris Agreement and what you have, all these nice words, but it is still difficult to put these words into deeds. But it is becoming a serious problem. The storms, you know, all the uh, environmental damage that it creates across the board, and the businesses and governments have to factor in climate change as a major element in their decision making and policy choices. We will be hurt and bitten very severely on this matter if we don't take it seriously. Then the players of the world energy have changed. It's no longer the OECD economies. It's no longer the big IOCs, ExxonMobil, Chevron, BP, Shell. We see also new, newest players emerging in this field. China is now number one energy economy in the world, number one carbon dioxide emission, emission, uh, the emitter uh, in the world. India is going to make a big impact on our energy system. And also, uh, the uh, regional or national oil gas companies, utilities, renewables companies are becoming more important. China in electrical uh, cars, China in renewables, the world leader, spending two times more than the US and EU combined in this area. So the future is there. Whether this is going to be a smooth, peaceful transition or with lots of disruption, we'll see. When we talk about disruption, I think the major disruption we will face, this is something we discussed two weeks ago in the London Energy Club, which I chair, the rise of renewables, what kind of disruption is going to cause? If you don't have a smooth, well-calibrated transition, which I doubt will happen, there is going to be huge disruption in you know, transiting from hydrocarbon economy to renewable economy. Mm. Because still, our world is fueled, fired by coal, oil, and gas. Share of renewables, important though, but still small. And if you have an investment flight all the way from hydrocarbons to renewables only or green technologies, we will face a supply crunch. Because if, if you don't invest today in oil and gas, coal, no matter we like it or not, uh, this is a fact of life for the foreseeable future, we will see a very serious decline of production. And then renewable will not be able to fill the gap. So we will have a disruption. Uh, That's one issue. Very Last, perhaps, but not least, in terms of game changers, geopolitics. We always know that geopolitics and energy cannot be uh, treated in isolation. It's all together. But again, this was the geopolitics of oil and gas, strategic choke points, shipping lines, pipelines. But whereas if there is a rise of renewables, it brings a different type of geopolitics about lithium, cobalt, uh, using, of course, electrical cars, and transmission, smart transmission lines. So it's going to be a different landscape in terms of geopolitics. And US is disengaging gradually from Middle East and the Gulf, where it depended in the past. Now it has independence, let alone independence. Trump is talking about global energy dominance. Then OPEC, what will be the future of OPEC? OPEC is set to disintegrate in the foreseeable future. Why? 
because they currently control about 32% of the world uh, oil supply. And if you remember, Qatar left, Equator left a couple of uh, weeks ago, Indonesia left. They say that it is now Iran and Venezuela perhaps preparing to leave. And then the three biggest producers in the world, this is United States, number one now in terms of production in the world, followed by Russia and Saudi Arabia. All together, perhaps there is a different combination of powers to dominate the world oil industry. The same goes for gas. No longer is Qatar, but Australia will be more important. East Africa. And what will happen in Arctic Sea? We haven't seen yet. So the world changes are significant, and we have to bear in mind and assess very carefully all these game changers if our businesses and our governments will take sound policy and business decisions. Let me stop here. So. Mm. I'm sure we'll continue. Uh, you put on the table a really, really nice subject. And uh, for each and every remark you had, I think we can speak for days. Uh, but it was a very, very nice summary uh, in general. And I would like to grab one thing that uh, you mentioned and throw it to Alessio. Um, you are mentioning about the smooth and ju just transition. What does it mean, just, tra uh, just transition from one of the biggest utilities in the world's perspective? So, I think that if we are very, very forward-looking, we come to a conclusion that we are not in the energy sector. We are in the people well-being sector. Mm. And this, I think, is the biggest change that we have to face and to understand. Because at the end of the day, you were mentioning Google. Google went directly to understand the, the need of the people. And whatever came up, they built something on. So it's an IT company, but its main, uh, let's say, characteristic is not to be an IT company, but it's ve to be very, very close to the people, to the customers, even when customers don't know that they are customers. So I think that this is the most relevant uh, uh, disruption that we are facing. Because uh, at the end of the day, uh, yes, uh, technology change, uh, regulation change, government change. So we are living in a very unpredictable uh, environment. We want our, let's say, financial results to be predictable with all this unpredictability, which is a kind of nonsense. Uh, but we can, uh, we can uh, uh, say that people, people is going to change? I don't think so. I think that if we, if we look at the but trends... What, what about the millennials? Mm. They have a different mindset. Absolutely, absolutely. So if, you are, if we are having this exercise okay, of looking at our sector in the next 20, 30 years, we will see that millennials will have a shift of uh, uh, wealth that is unprecedented in the history of humanity. So there will be a transfer of health only in the US of $75 billion in the next uh, 10 years to the, let's say, millennials Z generation, which is a huge amount, only in the US. Then we know that millennials, and unfortunately I am passed over the uh, millennial age, but I feel millennial inside. Um, uh, uh, millennials have a strong attachment, they have strong values, so they are looking to companies and to uh, uh, actors that are going to be connected with them as, let's say, employees, but also as consumers. And I think that this is the most fundamental change that we have to do in our business. Because at the end of the day, what you are discussed, what, what you presented, it's a, I like to see it like this. It's a very, very profound process of democratization. The consumers at the beginning of this, let's say, energy era, were the ones that were paying the bills. So this was the, let's say, they were essential because without consumers you cannot 
do all this architecture. But at the end of the day, what was the role of the consumer? To pay a bill. That's it. Now consumers are becoming more and more relevant in our sector, in the energy sector. And when I speak uh, uh, about our sector, I tend also to think that uh, the future of the energy sector is uh, electricity. Uh, gas, it's a very, very nice in-between commodity, okay? But we are also moving to a sector that is becoming more and more independent from commodities. Because renewables also has this effect. We are not anymore dependent of a commodity, and gas is a commodity. So I think that if we want to have strong policies that are in the interest of the consumer, the citizen, taking into account this very, very nice, enthusiastic and uh, 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 progressive democratization process, we should also think what kind of policy we want to implement. Does it have any sense to invest in very, very expensive, costly uh, gas, okay, pipelines, gas structure, structures, for something that maybe in 20 years, maybe even before, because we cannot predict uh, uh, the, 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 let's say, disruption of technology, but maybe it will be worthless. Maybe in 20 years, it will be very likely possible that people will be able, in small communities, to produce their own energy, and it will be electric energy. So, is it worth to have policy that maybe invest in innovation in storage? Yeah, because you said, okay, the geopolitical of the energy sector is changing. We are moving from commodities to, let's say, to the, uh, uh, let's say, a more uh, uh, minerarial, let's say, uh, commodity. Do we want to play this game again? Or do we have sufficient time to come up with technologies that can overcome this commodity problem? I think that it's worth to invest and to be extremely bold in this, to invest in what will be the possibility to have cheap, independent storage for electricity, because at the end of the day, this will be the future. So, I, I gave a slightly different angle from, from yours, uh, but I think it's worse. It's different, but uh, it's uh, actually very convergent, because, uh, again, we had the very nice geopolitical view about the general energy concepts. And then Alessio came and put the consumer and the end user in the middle of the uh, energy game. Now, Corina, uh, coming, back about, uh, coming back to, to, to consumers and uh, the challenges um, regarding this transition, um, where are we actually now in Romania? What are the challenges and what are the tipping points we should focus on? Okay, what's happened now in Romania is no different to what's happened in other countries. And please let me know to explain my, uh, my view regarding this. And uh, I think we are no different. Um, in the 90 years, all the... Um, system are uh, dispatched in the classic way. Yes, we have a consumption because it is the consumer which more or less they have a profile. And now we start to build this profile using the power plant which functioning in the base load, in special coal and nuclear, some of them, hydro. And then the differences between the, this uh, baseload production to the peak production or the real consumption of the customer are covered by flexible units. Now or today, uh, in this transition phase to the renewables, the concepts are totally changed. So we have the same profile more or less, of the customer, because none of the customer accepted to change their profile based on the 
on the price. There are very uh, few industries which accept to change their production and to follow the price, the market price. We have the renewables, which are unpredictable. So we need to build uh, and to cover from something unpredictable with something which is quite hard to be predictable until we not implemented the smart metering system to all the customer, to have all the information and to, to discuss about smart grid, smart city, smart metering points. And this is the main challenge of the transition, how we can cover this, which cannot be very well uh, uh, predictable. Uh, could be, and I think gas can be a solution. You don't ask me about this, but I think for Romania, gas, it is a solution for the transition period, because we have gas. And uh, uh, in the future, depends on the technology, because what's happened in the past, we have some legislation and all the system follow the legislation system. Now we have a system, we have new technology, and the system need to follow the new technology. I really believe that this concept, which, which it is uh, more or less uh, in, uh, in the energy sector, and to, to make face to these differences, you need to change the behavior and not to have a classical behavior where everything is be, uh, it's predictable, to have an agile behavior. I like very much this. And only because we are in this building, I think is the same changes not only in the energy sector, also what's happened with the war. How was done the first and second war when the army are very clear and uh, they are organized as a big army and they fight and everything are based on some rules. And what's happened today in the Middle East? Small, agile team and uh, innovative solution. I think this is the future. Mm. The customer, of course, will play a very important role in all these agile things. I think the future for the customer is not to sell to them only utilities. You need to sell more than this. You need to sell services. I don't believe that in the future they will pay a cost per megawatt hour. Doesn't matter if it is energy, gas. In this, you need to offer more services for them. And who will succeed it to offer more services will succeed to have a smooth transition. Better price, because we speak about market price, and this is a challenge for everybody, how the market price will follow the technology. And uh, the other kind of mobility already uh, discuss about this uh, communication. We can have uh, in the same place a lot of services, electricity, internet, and also communication. The same network used for delivering all this. I think this is the future of the transition. How could be done? I think the key words are technology, how flexible the organization will become, how agile will become, and how smart are the country to change very fast the legislation to follow the technology and all this behavior of the people. I think these are the three pylons that need to be changed in the future to have a smooth transition. Thank you very much for your input, and with this occasion, we'll open the discussion also for the, for the audience. It would be uh, really nice to hear all your inputs and uh, also your questions for, for our panelists. Uh, so just uh, feel free to make a discreet sign just for me to, to, to see you. Um, now, really, really interesting discussion. So basically, we are in a transition from, let's say, um, petrol or fossil dictatorship 
to a democratization of uh, the energy uh, system. Um, Mehmet mentioned uh, also a forecast about OPEC and uh, very, very traditional, let's say, bodies that were somehow governing the geopolitics of, uh, of energy. Uh, but, Alessio, are we still under a petro dictatorship or gas dictatorship? Or what is the, the role as of, uh, as, uh, as of today? Or these kind of concepts are there to stay or are there to be modified? I hope not. I hope that they will not stay, of course. Uh, why? I already said before, I think that uh, if we want to have a clear picture of the future, uh, we, we have to, to get out of the commodity mindset. Uh, the only relevant commodity in our sector is the client and has to, we have to have this attitude. There is no other way to survive. Uh, smart companies like Shell, for example, they have a big plan to enter in the utility sector, in the, in the electricity sector. And I think that because they are the most threatened in this, in, this, uh, in this moment, they understood and they are going to, to, to grab this opportunity, which is again in, in, in this sector. If you want to speak about energy and you want to have a long lasting, uh, let's say, uh, business plan, survive, you have to understand that electricity is the future. Full stop. Then we can discuss in the transition period uh, what is the role of gas, what is the role, role of oil. Very, very legitimate uh, questions or points, but it has to be for a transition period. That's it. So we are already, let's say, writing the funeral of, the, of, of those kind of commodities. I'm sorry, this is my... Mehmet? I, I, I think that when you see big industries eager to change their ADN to enter in another business, this is their assumption, it's not my assumption. When, when you see oil and gas moving to electricity, it means that they grabbed something. Of course, they will not dis disclose it <laughs> uh, on the public, in the public, but this is, it's, it's a very interesting move and it made a lot of people think. Now, having said that, why personally I think that this is the best option? Because it, it introduces the just approach, okay? So energy transition does not have to have winners or losers, okay? It has to be just. And in the moment in which you start from the assumption that the energy sector is based bottom up from the customers, well, the idea of just can, can be seen a little bit more clear. Again, if you speak about commodities, you, you say that there is someone that for different reasons, okay? Geographical reason, geopolitical reason, has a plus, a value, that is willing or not to share with other and play with it. If we start to have a bottom-up approach, the justness of the system can be achieved. And uh, just to end, uh, in, in the last period we are hearing uh, mostly in Europe, but also in the US, the new energy deal. Okay. And of course this goes to the new deal of after 29. And I think that the scale of this new energy deal, which is impacting all over the economy, it's not only like in 29 an economical approach, 
it's a systematic, social, economic, uh, geopolitical approach. And uh, I think that uh, when we start to hear high officials in the European Union or in the US uh, political environment to discuss open and loud about a new energy deal based on the renewables, well, I think that again, we have a quite clear picture okay, of where we are going to go. H how we are going to get there is a completely other story. It's a completely different journey, but the, 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 the assumption, the general assumption is that we are going to, 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 to go there to a more just energetic system Okay? based on re mostly on renewables taken out these classical commodities in a period of time that can be 20 years, 25, 30 years, or even faster because we cannot predict technology. Please. Yes, I think I have to play again the devil's advocate, if I may. Uh, one is, it's too early to organize a funeral for hydrocarbons, even 20, 25 years, because look at China, 1.4 billion, and the largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity, and currently 82% coal-dominated economy. With all the efforts they are making, they will reduce it perhaps to 60% by 2050. Mm -hmm. So imagine the Red India, Russia, these are all coal. Uh, we are not talking about Luxembourg, Monaco, you know, the small economies where you can achieve these things, or Jordan. So it will take a long time. And uh, of course, it depends also on the, what kind of technology, regulatory framework, and the incentives, the investment also, because when you look at the flow of investment dollars, and it's worrying, because last year, almost $300 billion invested in renewables, whereas in oil and gas, it was about $100, $110 billion. Of course, this is good news for the renewables, green economy, but bad news in the sense that there is going to be a supply crunch down the road in five, six years, while we haven't still achieved the transition. So mm. what I expect, technology as a disruptive force and the market pricing not operating so well, do we have market pricing? I mean, look at the taxes we have, we pay. And I hate paying uh, in Turkey or in London, 70% tax, over 30% the real price of the oil. And the same goes for electricity and other things. As consumers, unfortunately, we are not yet in the driving seat. Mm -hmm. It's the governments, cartels deciding mm -hmm. what the price will be. Of course, increasingly, there will be more um, individual ownership of energy. We will be producing energy at our home and put into the grid as well. But these are things which are on the show right now. I mean, for them to become widespread and commercially viable and applied across the world, I think we have to wait some uh, time. Geopolitics of renewables, I mentioned that. Of course, we will have different type of geopolitics. It will never end. Human instinct, unfortunately, reflected in government's policies are for tension, confrontation. Energy, in our lifetime at least, will not be a commodity for peace. We have seen it everywhere. They will, we will find new ways of conflicting for technology. There will be technology wars as we have now trade wars, currency wars. So the wars will not be waged by weapons as we know. So there are different ways. Look at Saudi Arabia. They had their, you know, uh, the, uh, the Pearl Harbor of Saudi Arabia, you know, 10 drones armed drones wiped out half of Saudi oil production, 5% of the global oil supply. And these are just probably a couple of thousand dollars worth of drones and you know, overcoming all these billions of dollars worth of uh, anti-missile system, uh, air system. So things are changing in this regard. The tension, confrontation, I'm afraid to say, will continue. Disruption will be maximum. It's not going to be just. It's not going to be smooth. We will have a disruption. And in this environment, investors will have to think twice or thrice before putting money into this 
projects, this will create also another disruption because we will not have enough energy to fuel us. Although now we are living in an area of abundance, and 10 years later, if we are not catching up, as you say, the governments are responding in a you know, rapid and agile manner, and individuals are not properly empowered, and then we will have a real trouble. I think we have to say about this. Then this is also a warning to our governments or international organizations or business leaders that they have to bear in mind all these things and have a foresight of what might come. So business as usual, best scenario or worst scenario. You have to work on three levels and find the right way. Otherwise, we will be in very serious risk of disruption in energy. Can, can I give a brief? That's the devil's advocate. Very, very short. This is exactly because you mentioned China, Russia, India, Saudi Arabia. This is why I personally think that a commodity like energy, electricity, that is so relevant for the well-being of people should be taken out of the system from an idealistic standpoint. Then people tend to grab power when somebody is trying to not them to have it. Third one, it's, I think, Harry Ford that said, if horses would have had the power to vote, we would not have cars. So, again, uh, yes, of course, there will be resistance. But you can resist it until uh, up to uh, one point. Then you break. Okay, I'm in the middle. So I, my position is quite balanced. <laughs> I think the efficiency will be the, that one will close or will start the funerary of the, of the gas, the efficiency and the cost. And I make, uh, or we have today, the, the situation with the coal in Romania. Yeah, when everybody knows that the price of the CO2 certificates go on the, on the sky, so the efficiency of the energy production based on coal is not efficient anymore. So that means all this will decrease. Doesn't matter uh, if it is, uh, if there remain resources. I think everybody will try to uh, change this with other kind of solution, gas, more flexible. If you have the resources in your country, uh, increasing the interconnection between the country, this could be another solution. And I think this will be the way that will be follow uh, of this sector. I'm looking and I agree, Mehmet, geopolitical. Every country will use the resources that they have it in their region. If they have in their region gas, they will use that gas. If not, they will try to uh, change this or to replace with other solution. And we discuss now about uh, renewables in Middle East. They already start, doesn't matter if they have or they are on the first position of the gas and oil production. They already start to use renewables. They are also, and I see that there are solutions in the small nuclear in the future. And also, this can be a solution. If the technology will increase so much, this could be the solution for the town, for the small town. Uh, renewables and gas, if we are gas, why? We cannot use it. If it is efficient, then the mix that will have that country will include also gas. At the end of the day, everybody, when they, uh, they have the line, they want to have a positive result. And if it is efficient, it will be used, I think, until this resource will start to, to decline or to be on the market, other technology which can uh, more or less cover this segment of flexibility which uh, the gas uh, offer to the energy sector. Thank you. If there are also questions or interventions from the room, we'd be more than happy to take it. Please. Uh, Corina, it's not that 
Listen, yeah. if we assume and if we all agree that uh, we are living the era of disruption, okay, and things are going to change in a way that is unpredictable, I, I think that the first mistake we should not do drafting uh, uh, primary, secondary law and drafting, uh, uh, let's say, uh, energy strategy uh, for countries, for the European Union, is to assume that the past will repeat it, itself. So, again, of course, if, and you put it in a very, very correct way, cost efficient. So, we have to introduce, for example, and not because I have something against gas, it's, let's say, a debate and it's, uh, Okay, worth exploring. If uh, we assume that uh, in 20 years, and I don't have the calculation, but I think that it's a worth uh, a while uh, uh, exercise, that in 20 years there will be no need of gas for heating, uh, uh, for the consumption of the industry, the cities, and whatever. Okay. And in between, we uh, uh, create a gas pipeline infrastructure. Who will pay the cost? Because you said you don't like to pay taxes. Okay, if, if this will be at one point maybe useless, somebody will pay it and you will have it on the bill. So why don't, uh, don't we have the capability to understand that the system, a disruption of the system is really a disruption of the system. So you have to to put new pieces in the equation that can bring a very different approach and a very different result. If we start to think and to design solution, taking the mindset of the past, we will fail. And I think that this is the context. We have to be a little bit more courageous in our approach. You have right, Alessio. What I mentioned is if you have that resources in your country, you need to use it. Because then, then, of course, if it is efficient. And uh, about this we speak now, yes? No. I don't see any reason not to use these resources if you don't have something different to, to, to replace or to whom to replace. I think, as you say, countries are not homogeneous. They have different resource endowments. I mean, I know China in and out. There, for example, centers of consumption are on the eastern seaboard. Guangzhou, Beijing, you know, Shanghai, you go all the way. Whereas production is in the hinterland or in the western area. So you have to transport all of them there. But the Chinese are so smart they realize that although they have resources in Xinjiang or other areas, rather than transporting them there, they import LNG because it's more economical for them. So they will find a way. But in our world today, if we have a green, in quotation marks, fundamentalism, which is not green itself, it has also serious environmental implications, but better than coal, of course, and then we cannot find solutions because, as you say, which I agree with, uh, we have a balanced mix of different fuels. Reduce the share of coal as much as we can. We don't want 80% China coal dominated uh, or 90% gas dominated. But we want to have good, because also pricing is not sometimes so important. Because in Portugal, they just had a recent auction. The renewable project there had 1.3 cent per kilowatt hour. In Turkey, we were paying about 12 cents per kilowatt hour feed-in tariff for 10 years. Nobody wants to do this. So the cost is coming, more competitive than hydrocarbons in renewables. But we have to calculate apple to apple, not apple to orange. Yes. And uh, this one thing. But also you should have nuclear in your energy mix. Absolutely. Uh, hydro, oil, gas. You say electrification. Yes, electrification. But electric electricity, how do you get it? Not only from renewables. Today we generate electricity, both from coal-fired power plants, gas-fired power plants, uh, and I agree, and whatever. but we are speaking on a timeline that is not tomorrow. It's a timeline of 10, 15, 20, 30 years. You're speaking about China. The, 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 GDG, the demographic of China is increasing year by year. Okay, it's where 
one billion and a half, uh, then they become two billions. So they are in they, the, the number Aging of people. Aging population, they are coming down. But until uh, 15 years ago, they were one billion. Now they are one and a half billion, something like this. Uh, Europe is, is, uh, is demographic is decreasing. So again, we have to be very responsible with the future generation. Which costs are we putting them to pay? I think that this is a very relevant discussion. And again, I am absolutely convinced that we have to think in a different way. And it's not about cutting the uh, carbon uh, because you don't have anything in place. The people over there do not have other options. You have to find, but it's about designing in time, and you have the time, the, the time that is ticking, you have time and you need to have the correct primary and secondary legislation in place, taking into account that what was before is not anymore applicable. That, that's it. It's not something very, very different. Uh, we are about to close our conversation, but uh, and Mehmet, I will start with you just because I want to give a little bit more time for Corina and Alessio to uh, choose their, uh, their, uh, carefully their words. Uh, with one last question. Um, having all these factors, all these challenges, uh, all these uh, very disruptive um, elements, what would be your message for Romania and its leaders when it comes about energy transition? And I'm, uh, when I say leaders, I mean both business, politic and, and so on. Yes, I mean, thank you for this question. Romania is quite fortunate among many other countries because it has a quite rich resource base in oil, in natural gas, and uh, also uh, aspiring for uh, nuclear. And, but like other countries, Romania has to follow very, very closely all these game changers happening in a fast pace. So the government, it seems, have not grasped that yet because Romania has some discussions, but I haven't seen any integrated energy framework in Romania, which is very important in terms of giving some sense of direction to investors and also operators and producers in the energy world. And you are also somehow constrained by EU membership. There is a straitjacket there. EU tried to treat member countries like one size fits all. Differentiation should be taken into account as much as possible. And, but I think realizing this uh, chaotic and unstable, unpredictable global trends, so you have to weigh on top of that. Mm. The only way is to do like this discussion that we are having it, thanks to Bucharest Forum, is to understand what's really happening in the world and how we can connect to this. And technology also is the name of the game, as uh, was mentioned uh, today. Funding will be critically important. You know, follow the money. Money knows where to go. Because whatever the governments say, I mean, as investors, we don't care much. We take note of it. But investors know where the value is, how it can be generated, and also future prospects, risk factors, mitigation, and all this stuff. Therefore, we have to follow money, listen to money, but also, of course, our uh, soft underbelly is our public, our individuals, what they want for the future. But also, don't think that we are alone in Turkey, in Romania, and in EU. We are probably about 20% of the whole picture in the globe. But 80% have different expectations, different experiences, different resource base, and it's only ideal to say that we should aim for a peaceful transition and good for energy for all, energy for peace. These are nice words, but in reality, unfortunately, we have to prepare for the worst. But Romania is in a more comfortable and fortunate position than many other countries. Perhaps you could also set example to others and also perhaps more active in EU context as a you know, large member country and to influence the decisions uh, rather than everything being imposed from one center on other member countries on carbon emissions, efficiency, 
and our beautiful blueprints, 2020, 2020, now 2050, these are wonderful pieces of papers, but they are a bit disconnected from the reality, uh, not in consultation or connection with the real stakeholders. And therefore, I think there is a role to play for Romania also in terms of the regional energy market, Southeast Europe, including Turkey. And there is a big role for Romania to play in that due to its uh, geostrategic position, due to its resource base, experience. I mean, yesterday we were in this town, uh, you know, celebrating 120 years of oil industry and first refinery in the world. So you have a great uh, ingredients of becoming an uh, example role model. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> uh, Corina, we are all alone, nobody here. Please feel free. What is your message for our leaders and including you? <laughs> so, uh, for the political and legislative things, uh, create a correct framework to protect the vulnerable customer and uh, let the money to flow to the project. And for the business, make it happen the project because I think we speak too much and we to do so few things in the last 20, 30 years. Alessia? I think that a just transition should be the target. So a clear set target, not something that is a fancy word or a fancy discussion. Uh, I think that if we put it in the context of the new energy deal, again, I think about the new deal of, of, uh, of 1929, which created the foundations of our well-being at the end of the day. So I have such expectation when people use such words, and I think that it's a call to action for everybody. And I, if I may, I make a suggestion to the, let's say, decision-making uh, uh, people in Romania, it will be the following. Uh, not to be, uh, let's say, uh, uh, not to be very, very uh, keen uh, to a technology or uh, to a past. I would rather prefer, or a commodity. I would rather prefer, I would rather suggest them to have a more opportunistic approach. And uh, for me, opportunistic, it's okay. This is the context in which we are playing, which is the European one, which has some difficulties. And exactly, I want to play a role. And for me, the best role that Romania could play is not as a commodity, let's say energy commodity provider, but for example, the, the IT sector could be the most relevant uh, benefit that Romania could have and bring to Europe. Because if you are speaking about digitalization, uh, customer-centric approach, this will involve uh, a huge amount of IT skills. And I think that one of the only countries in Europe that can provide such expertise is in is Romania. So for me, put your money on the people commodity and not on the natural resources commodity. Because at one point they will end, people not. Thank you very much. Thank you for your contribution. I will just end with a quote that the mankind didn't evolve from the Stone Age because the stone was finished, but because better technologies were invented. And uh, we we'll had very interesting time but I think what is the most interesting will actually come in the, in the very, very close future. Thank you so much. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your kind input. Thank you all for uh, being present here. And I give the floor to the organizers. We do go into a 15-minute break, but please make it 15 minutes because the foreign minister of Moldova is anxious to get on the stage. Great.
Doamnelor și domnilor, începem la București Forum un panel pe care eu îl consider foarte interesant și simt nevoia să spun câteva cuvinte în limba română, pentru că suntem doi români aici, la București Forum, în acest panel. E o mare privilegiu și o bucurie pentru mine să-l avem pe Nicu Popescu, ministrul afacerilor externe al Republicii Moldova, un prieten bun și de nădejde al ASPAN și GMF, pentru a marca acest moment și această zi, această zi specială, vreau doar o secundă să vă spun că astăzi este ziua de lansare a acestei broșuri, acestei cărți la editura Meteoro Press. Amenințări și oportunități strategice pentru România. Este un dialog, cred eu, foarte util cu Mircea Joană, care astăzi își preia poziția de secretar general adjunct al NATO cu ambasadorul Wolfgang Geschinger, care este președintele Conferinței de Securitate de la München, și cu generalul american Ben Hodges. Găsiți acolo, mulțumită organizatorilor și editorii Meteor Press, acest volum și altele interesante. Uh, Nicu Popescu, welcome to Bucharest Forum again. 20 years ago, Bucharest was uh, the most interesting capital in Eastern Europe, because 20 years ago, Romania was not in NATO, was not in EU. We had the NATO offensive in former Yugoslavia. And also we have this uh, Russian request to cross the Romanian airspace. And uh, only one week after this request was made, the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, General Wesley Clark, was here in Bucharest. I think somehow, right now, the most interesting capital in Eastern Europe from non-allied space is Chisinau. Do you agree with me? You know, maybe it's interesting for you, but for me, <laughs> it doesn't make my life easier, but <laughs> we live in one of the most interesting capitals. Um, and I can tell you in details, in a lot of details, how interesting it is. Um, and yeah, I think, as you know, what makes us interesting and special is that wherever, whenever you read news, you read a lot of news about geopolitical competition, conflict, tensions between East and West, and if I go back to the title of the conference, sometimes we miss East, the West meets the East and sometimes they clash, and sometimes they pass talk each other. But what gets makes Moldova difficult and interesting if you're an analyst, but difficult if you have to manage this, is the fact that, as many of you know, we have a coalition of political parties which campaigned on a pro-European, pro-Western platform, and we have who entered into an alliance with a party which traditionally always wanted Moldova to develop closer relations with, uh, with Russia. So we basically have political forces which have opposing, which had opposing foreign policy preferences and platforms, and they have opposing foreign policy, you know, opposing bits of the electorate which want different things in foreign policy. And these forces join together forces in order to fight corruption, what we call in Moldova, de-oligarchize the country. Uh, and we decided to put aside for a while, not forever, but for a while, our foreign policy differences in order to work on the things that unite uh, not just us, but most of our society. And I confess that, you know, the main fault line of this, it's easy to be in agreement over your desire to fight corruption and to reform the justice sector and to improve the functioning of policing. Um, but all these differences in foreign policy preferences are falling on my shoulders. So I actually am probably one of the most stressed ministers uh, because of the fact that all these geopolitical winds and currents are passing through my table. Um, and so far we've if you want me to ask another question, I can do, but if you give me two more minutes. Uh, the way we handle this is the following. And the way we try to keep this construction more or less stable for now is 
the fact that the pro-European bits of the coalition agreed with the Socialist Party of Moldova on, a num on one key principle of conducting foreign policy. And that key principle is the fact that Moldova will not backtrack, will not revise its pre-existing foreign policy commitments. In practical terms, this means that Moldova continues to implement the association agreement with the European, European Union, continues to be part from the free trade area with the European Union, continues and develops the individual partnership action plan with NATO, continues to recognize and strengthen and deepen our strategic partnership with Romania and Ukraine, continuous engagement and military cooperation with the United States and participation in military exercises. So that gives me the freedom to do quite a lot of things in trying to lock Moldova into a relationship with the EU and the US and North America that is deepening. Uh, great opportunities, uh, many ideas. Uh, Nico Popescu, what is uh, the Moldovan government is preparing for this winter? Because I think the energy issue is one of the most important. When you're talking about the relation between Bucharest and Chisinau, between Romania and Republic of Moldova, I think the government of the Republic of Moldova is trying to uh, accept or request a strategic help from Romania. Is it true? It's true, and it's not that we just requested, we actually receive a lot of it. Uh, so I'll, I'll just give you some numbers. So I've been in government since the 8th of June, so it's what, four months and a bit, and it's my fifth trip to Bucharest. And I've been three times to Brussels, twice in Kiev, and that tells you how important is our partnership with Romania, uh, and it reaches a lot of levels. And one of these most important levels is Moldova's energy security. And there are several things that are happening on that front. So we in Moldova are worried that this winter there is a certain chance that there might be disruption, disruptions in gas supply due to Russian-Ukrainian negotiations on gas transit and gas supplies. And it happened before a few times that because of things that did not depend on Moldova, and Moldova is buying all of, virtually all of its gas from Russia, but because of things that do not depend on us, we ended up not receiving gas uh, supplies in time. So we are quite worried and we're watching with attention what is happening between Kiev and Moscow on all fronts, but also on the energy front. And the next stage in their talks will be the 28th of October when they are supposed to agree on something, but there are chances that they will not agree on the 28th of October and they might agree on the 31st of December or maybe after. So we've been looking for ways to avoid an energy crisis. And here we've been working with Romania very closely. Uh, Romania is now building a gas pipeline to Chisinau. So there's a gas interconnector, but now Transgas is building a pipeline to Chisinau, and Chisinau has the biggest, is the biggest area where gas is consumed. And last week, Ramon Manescu, the Romanian Minister of Foreign Affairs until a few days ago, uh, was in Chisinau, and we visited together the uh, gas pipeline that is being built. Initially, we hoped we'd have this pipeline by the end, before this winter, but it will only be ready in late February or March next year. So from next year, Moldova will be in a much better place when it comes to gas supply, and that's thanks to Romania and thanks to an investment by the Romanian state and by Romanian uh, company, by the Romanian company Transgas. But we are missing this winter. So we've been looking for other possibilities to get uh, gas supplies from other sources. One possibility is to buy if Bulgaria builds an 11 in time, an 11 kilometer interconnector into Turkish stream and then pump some gas through the Bulgarian Romanian gas system into Moldova. That's one possibility we've been exploring and another was to buy gas around this time to store it in the Ukrainian gas uh, storage and then have it shipped and supplied to Moldova in winter. And we needed the loan, so we've been talking to some potential um, uh, credit institutions. And we've also been talking 
uh, to the Romanian government about a 200 million loan from Romania to buy gas now while it's cheaper. Uh, but unfortunately, we were just about to reach that <laughs> moment where we can sign that signature and domestic politics uh, came into our and Romania's calculations. These things happen. Um, so for now, you know, we're, we're desperately hoping that this moment of transition between governments in Romania is as short as possible so that we can come back and talk about Romania's declared help and desire to help us. But, you know, you still need a minister that has the right to put this signature on a pretty big amount of money. So we've been working on this, and Romania is incredibly supportive for all of these uh, efforts we, we are doing. But, but now we're waiting for Romania to have a government, and once we do this, we'll immediately feel safer about this winter. While you are speaking, I got a message from General Director of Transgas. It's about your message. It's working. So somebody listen to your message, and I hope that the other responsibilities from Romanian government will help our friends from Republic of Moldova not to spend their last energy winter with the Russians. It's the last one. Because from February, you will spend with us all the winters. It, it's a bit more complicated because it would have been easier if you could produce a lot of gas. <laughs> so I think the, the, the objective for next year is for us to be able to buy gas for, from different sources. And we've also been, as, not for next year, but you know, we've been already been talking to the Americans about potential LNG supplies through Croatia, pumped through Balkans via Romania. So I think from next year, we'll just have options. Um, and these options, some of it will be regional, some of it will be extra regional. But of course, you know, Romania doesn't produce enough gas to cover all our needs and even Romania's needs. So from next year, we will have options and this hopefully will have cheaper access, access to cheaper gas. Um, but, but for a sustainable long-term solution for gas supplies, we'll see where we get. I hope Romania will play the most important role. One last question for you, and then I want to go to uh, speak with our uh, participants. If the United Kingdom will do the Brexit and they will leave EU, will you be so kind to join EU after the, EU, the Brexit? We'd, we'd love to join. <laughs> We're ready to join any moment. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we have no issues with backstops or lack of backstops, you know. <laughs> We're ready to be very flexible on whatever. <laughs> but if we are serious, uh, you know, we want to join the EU. Also, in Moldova, you have some parts of the electorate which would rather increase cooperation with the EU, other parts which would rather look elsewhere. But what I'm always saying in Chisinau is that I haven't seen, it, it doesn't matter what people think about their po foreign policy preferences and where they would like Moldova to go in geopolitical terms. What absolutely unites every single citizen in Moldova is the fact that they want European kindergartens, European hospitals, European roads, and I haven't met, and you will not meet a single Moldovan who says that I don't want European roads, I don't want European hospitals. So this gives us a uniting platform in our society that makes us want to join the EU. At the same time, last year, Moldova was on the 117th place on the Corruption Perception Index. I think Romania is the 60th, more or less. Uh, so just imagine, and Moldova's position deteriorated in the last years. In the first half of this year, Union Fenosa, a Spanish energy company, and Societe Generale, French bank, withdrew from the Moldovan market because of corruption. So it's not that we were not attracting investors. We were losing investors because of corruption. So before we seriously talk about our European aspirations, we need to do our homework. You know, I cannot go to Brussels and say, you know, take us in, 
with such bad grades and such bad performance of our institutions at home. So I think, you know, talk of EU accession is good and we want that, but, but before we can really seriously promote this, we need to sort our mess uh, back home. Okay, so we have 10 minutes for discussions with the public. Who wants to address uh, some uh, questions for Niku Popescu? Tim Judah, please. Thank you. I'm Tim Judah from The Economist. Uh, you can do, you, you, could, you could make Moldova perfect. You could solve your problems with Transnistria, and then you might end up like North Macedonia. And as we've seen in the last, uh, what, 48 hours of the French uh, refusing to allow North Macedonia and Albania, but that's slightly different, to, to uh, advance on their, on their EU path. I mean, doesn't that make you panic. I mean, you haven't quite got there yet, but it, it, it implies to smaller countries that this, the, the promise that we've talked about for the last 10, 15 years, it's, it's, it's not true. If I look back at the last almost 30 years, I see a lot of windows of opportunity, you know, closing and opening and closing and opening. I think what matters is for you, or for us in this case, to be ready to jump into that window of opportunity when it's open. And even if you would not have this context that is not very favorable to enlargement, if you're not ready, it doesn't matter. So I cannot have any influence on on the interaction between the EU and North Macedonia and Albania. It's, what I can have an influence on is how Moldova is governed and to prepare the country and fight and struggle and push and push the country to a situation where when there is a window of opportunity that we can seize it. Because even if everything would be perfect and what you just described would be an easy walk and you'd have easy summits about EU enlargement, we wouldn't be there because of us. So the only pragmatic and realistic thing we can do is to prepare and train for this moment. And if I look back and I try to predict the future, I'm confident that political cycles, you know, they have their own ups and downs, and we have to be ready for the next upward trend in the pan-European political mood on enlargement and other issues. Uh, and just to give you an example, we've actually done really well in integrating Moldova in the European economy. And even, you know, you have a lot of anti-immigration sentiment in the EU, you read in the news about how difficult it is to handle migration issues. But Moldova got a visa-free regime with the European Union five years ago. It took like 15 years of persuading, but actually once this happened, nothing bad happened. I mean, no Europeans got upset or stressed by this. And by the way, the political leadership in the EU could deliver on visa-free to us, to Ukraine, to Georgia, and the Balkans before, even though apparently public opinion in the EU was not very willing to envisage a liberalization of the travel regime with a lot of countries. So I also see on this specific case, we're on a highly divisive political issue in the EU. The leaders of the EU could deliver on visa-free regime, not just for small countries, even for bigger ones. So this makes me optimistic that there will be other cases. Now I started saying that we've already been successful in integrating Moldova into one important area of, of the EU functioning, and that's the European internal market. So one of the most striking statistics for our country is that we have 68% of Moldovan exports go to the European Union. 68. And 8% are directed towards the Russian market, eight. There are several EU and NATO member states which are more dependent on the Russian market than we are. 
This gives us a completely different domestic political and geopolitical and strategic set of circumstances. It gives us the comfort of no longer fearing trade restrictions and embargoes, which Moldova feared 10 years ago because they were painful. But now it's painful, but it's small pain compared to how painful it was 10 years ago. And why do we have this? Because we signed the deep, deep and comprehensive free trade area with the EU. So we've already anchored Moldova economically. What we have, to, and then I think for us the next fight as a country is to anchor Moldova not just economically, but to anchor Moldova politically in the European space. Not just as EU membership, but as the functioning of institutions, as the functioning of courts, as the functioning of police. And that's the next struggle. And on trade, three countries signed deep and comprehensive free trade area provisions as part of the association agreement with you. Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine. In the last five years, Moldova had plus 60% of its exports going to the EU. Ukraine had plus 20, and Georgia had plus 9%. So we've also been the greatest, by far the greatest beneficiary of this trade access to the EU, and we really benefited from that. Talking about North Macedonia, I would like to see Republic of Moldova first a NATO member, and then EU will come. It was the same for Romania. So, who knows, it's more difficult, and maybe a higher target. But if I'll see Republic of Moldova first a NATO member, then EU will come for sure. Uh, thank you, team. Uh, somebody else over there? Thank you. Uh, I want to welcome Foreign Minister here and from Armenia, Arsen Haradzian. Um, we are going through a post-revolution period in Armenia, as you may be following, and um, there is a lot of uh, processes with regards to transitional justice and, and, and cleaning basically the past, or illustration for that matter. I wonder whether your administration is considering any form of, uh, I don't want to call it illustration, but looking back and uh, 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 dealing with the past, whether it's the last five years, the decade, and or since the independence. And I think because we're following your judicial, for example, reforms and other things, we're trying to understand what are uh, possible models that could be repl replicated in our case. But I wonder what is the philosophy of your administration in dealing with the past? We're still positioning ourselves for <laughs> a philosophy to deal with the past, but we've looked a bit into what happens in Armenia, but we've also looked a bit more into what happens in Albania with the vetting of judges. And, you know, the package on judicial reform, the legislative package is just being prepared now. So I would not build, you know, expand too much on, on that. We've had a number of urgencies throughout summer. We had, you know, we need to plug several holes in the budget and, you know, try to ensure that we have gas for this winter. And in the meantime, we're positioning ourselves to come up with a robust set of reforms in the justice sector, but the exact parameters of that are not yet clear beyond the law on prosecution, which we already voted in parliament. But but we have major issues with the judiciary, with the Constitutional Court. Uh, last year, the European Union suspended all of its assistance to Moldova because the judicial system was politicized and corrupt. Um, so now the problem has been so deep that we're still trying to find the right parameters of moving forward on that front. Thank you. One last question, because time slides very much. I would like to stay with Nico Popescu and our friends until tonight, but one last question, and then the panel of security is coming. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency, the Minister. Uh, I would like, I've been uh, accredited to Moldova for the last two years, try to understand the internal politics that's in, and its dynamics for the last two years, and I have to admit I failed to, uh, to reach a conclusion. I was so glad now that you said that the parties have agreed of at least uh, the, the external policies. 
with suspension of the president for five times in the last two years uh, to pass some laws. How do you see the conciliation within the different parties within? Because definitely it will affect your relations outside and your intentions, whether it is to strike a balance of going towards the EU or your strategic alliances or strategic relations with other powers at the time. So where are you now? I, you know, you've had people and some of my colleagues and, you know, have spent much longer time not just watching but actually taking part in Moldovan politics and we still don't understand it fully. And most of the leaders of today's governing coalition in Moldova, they are on the record saying that if anyone told them back in February that they would make a coalition, they would have got very upset with the person who suggested this. So, uh, and we're still trying to come to a way of making this interaction work. And there is a lot of friction, quite a lot of it is in the public space. Uh, the actors are not very shy about stating their differences on foreign policy. But at the same time, there is a determination to get things done on domestic reforms, on foreign policy. And especially on my front, given that we are not yet in a position to have an integrated strategy and look ahead for five or ten years and deliver it. What we've been trying to do in foreign policy is to create new realities that lock Moldova into cooperative partnerships with our partners on all kinds of areas, on energy with Romania I just described, on cyber security, on, you know, commercial and trade access on trade deals and do as much as we can to lock Moldova into some kind of commitments that strengthen the country's functioning, strengthens, you know, increases its prosperity, but also predetermines to some extent future foreign policy choices as well. Thank you, Nico Popescu, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Moldova. Give him applause. And thank you all for being here. Ciprian, the floor is yours. And, uh, we should success in uh, Moldova uh, objectives related to uh, NATO and uh, EU. The next panel will address uh, um, the subject related security in our region, Middle East, and uh, not only to the, this to do. And I will invite uh, Alina to continue to facilitate the discussions with uh, our great uh, participants. Thank you. Thank you, Ciprian. We've been talking a lot these days, given the title of the forum as well, about the volatility of the uh, international context. Volatility when it comes to economy, volatility when it comes to geopolitics, volatility when it comes to social changes. We haven't quite talked extensively about volatility when it comes to security. And maybe this is the area where the volatility is felt the most, at least in this region, and the area where volatility is the most dangerous. We have been looking at the Middle East. We have not been looking extensively and enough at our part of the world, at Eastern Europe, where there are a lot of security threats. There are different perceptions of the threats, where there are a lot of military threats and new hybrid informational um, and destabilization, economic destabilization threats. With the help of uh, my wonderful panelists, we will be discussing, and with your help as well, with, with, with your questions and comments, we will be discussing 
the entire realm of security, looking eastwards, looking southwards, and looking across the ocean as well. The first panelist, which I would like to invite on the stage, Bobo Lowe. He lives in Paris, he works in Paris. He is with the French Institute of International Relations. Please join me, Bobo. Then we do have another panelist from, uh, from Israel, Eli Carmon. He is the senior research scholar at the International Institute for Counterterrorism in Herlitzia. I have asked my colleague and friend Radu Tudor to also join us on this panel, if he is with us still. Well, he, he will join us um, uh, eventually. And then last but not least, Mr. Omer Orhan, who is Director General for International Security Affairs with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Turkey. We have been discussing Syria. We have been discussing Turkey have not been discussing Ukraine, but we hope to do this in this, uh, in this panel. We have not been discuss discussing enough tensions in the U.S. and how they affect the uh, international security context. We hope to do so in this panel. And also, we haven't been looking enough at the tensions between the transatlantic uh, uh, allies and how they affect the security context. Radu, please. Yeah, I I'll be standing. We will also be looking at the cyber and hybrid and informational activities of the opponents of the, of the alliance, both to the east and even farther east. But also, last and not least, having uh, had a little, um, um, a little talk with Sorin Dukaru, we will also be discussing, if possible, the increased satellite activity, which is absolutely not regulated and what's happening in the outer space where again the opponents of the um, of the alliance seem to uh, seem to seem to be doing quite well the volatility of the international context again has been has been very long talked about and it looks like something more serious than just volatility is happening there are treaties which are being uh, which are being broken or are not being ratified um, there are old um, alliances which, seems, uh, which, which, which are being broken. There are old partnerships which are broken. Bobo, are we witnessing something more serious than just volatility of, of, the, of the international context? Are we witnessing more than just the return of major power politics? Are we witnessing something more structural than that? The short answer is yes. I think we're seeing something much more seismic. So. What I wanted to talk today about was international security, but in the context of the global order. And specifically, I wanted to try and answer three questions. One is, what kind of situation do we have today? Uh, is it just merely great power, return to great power conflict, or is it something much more fundamental, much more structural? The second question I wanted to to ask is, to what extent are countries, are powers, emerging powers like China and Russia responsible for the current crisis or, or doubt, uncertainty in the world order? And the third question is, what can we in the West, what can we, what should we do about it? Now, it seems to me that the liberal order and international security is in its worst crisis since the end of the Cold War. Even the very notion of a rules-based international order has become widely discredited. What are the rules? Who makes the rules? And most important, perhaps, who abides by the rules? Now, we talk about the crisis of, of a liberal order, but yet there's no sign of an alternative order. We keep talking about a non-Western, a multipolar order, but there is no such order that's emerging. What we have instead is not a rules-based international order based on any rules, great power rules, liberal rules. What we have, ladies and gentlemen, is a new world disorder. And what are the features? We have a lack of clarity in the rules. We have the de-universalization of international norms. We have the limitations of great powers being exposed on an almost daily basis. We have a collapse of morals and ethics. 
We have a general crisis of leadership, worse than at any time, I would argue, since the 1930s. We have multilateralism and its shortcomings being exposed on the world stage, again, on an almost daily basis. Now, people talk about the end of ideological conflict, but that's not true, is it? Because we are seeing new ideological conflicts. It's no longer communism versus capitalism, but it's between internationalism and nationalism, between centrism and different types of extremism. Ideological conflict have just become more numerous, more fragmented, more fluid, and harder to grasp. We are seeing an increased likelihood of military conflict. For the first time in decades, there is, admittedly, it's still an outside possibility of a major war. There's runaway globalization. People talk about the end of globalization, but there is no end to globalization. Globalization is irreversible, but what has changed is the nature of globalization. It's no longer Western-led globalization. The second question, how much does, should uh, Beijing and Moscow bear for this situation? Mm -hmm. Now, as you well know, I'm sure, there's a really popular narrative, particularly in the United States, that China and Russia form a neo-authoritarian alliance whose purpose is nothing less than to destroy a rules-based liberal international order. Now, it's certainly true that Chinese and Russian actions in parts of the world have been extremely unhelpful, have undermined this liberal world order. But the very notion that of a Sino-Russian conspiracy, a Sino-Russian plot to undermine the rules-based international order is nonsense. First, what order are we talking about? Is it a liberal world order? Is it a Donald Trump-led world order? Or is it some other kind of world order? And then the second thing is that we forget, we th there's not this country called China, America, China, Russia. China and Russia, yes, they are authoritarian regimes, but they are individual actors with separate interests. Now, sometimes those interests converge, but many times those interests diverge significantly. And one area where they diverge fundamentally is in the view of world order of international security. China still aspires to be, work within the existing international system mm -hmm. because it recognizes that for all its flaws, from the Chinese perspective, this system has been very, very good to it. And so it naturally wants a continuation of this. Partly also because it knows that the replacement is not a new international order, it's anarchy. And that's the last thing that the Chinese want. But the Russians, the Russians think this international order has screwed us systematically over the last 30 years. Therefore, we want to see its demise. So the attitudes of Moscow and Beijing to the notion of international order, international stability, fundamentally different. Now, the question is, what, if it's not China and Russia's fault mainly, what is the problem? I think there are three quick problems, quick. Or three main problems. One is the huge gap between the rhetoric, the principles, the values that we espouse in the liberal world order and the way we seek to implement them. First problem. Second problem is Western policy making over the last two decades in particular, has been seen not only as morally dubious, morally questionable, but as inept. So it's one thing to be immoral, it's another thing to be inept, but it's a disastrous thing to be both inept and immoral. And so we are not a model for others. And then the third problem are the fundamental problems in our own societies. The nexus, the long-time nexus between democratic governance and good governance has been broken in many countries. We are no longer a model to emulate in large parts of the world and indeed in large parts of our society. So what do we do about it? Well, essentially, we don't give Russia and China and other countries the space to exploit our shortcomings. We try and address our shortcomings. 
We try and restore the credibility of liberalism. And that means two things. Internationally, it means narrowing the gap between rhetoric and practice. We need to show that we are capable of addressing real security challenges like global climate change, like worsening global poverty, like migration, like technological adaptation. Because these, not great power rivalry or geopolitical confrontation, these are the true security challenges of the 21st century. And domestically, we have to look to our own. We have to address problems like r racism, xenophobia, and the steady erosion of the rule of law in many Western democracies. Because until we address those problems, there is no hope for a liberal order, and there's very little prospect of our addressing the international security challenges that confront us all. Thank you. Thank you, Bobo. You mentioned divergence several times, if I'm not mistaken, among many other things. I do want to I do want to um, um, talk a little bit about a possible divergence in the region and within the alliance. And the next question goes to you, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Anhan. Turkey and what's going on in northern Syria, the purchase of S-400 uh, <coughs> missiles from Russia and the consequent uh, sanctions coming from, uh, from the US. These are reasons of concern within the alliance that Turkey has become a difficult partner. Is this concern true? Does this, is this concern um, grounded in, in something, in a real change in Turkey towards its attitude um, uh, towards NATO? Or is this just an over, uh, overestimation of, uh, of, the, of the allies? Uh, well, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, it was really interesting to uh, hear Mr. Law's opening uh, remarks. Uh, so uh, before going into what uh, the questions that mm -hmm. you directed to me, uh, allow me to make a few comments uh, on the general uh, security environment because I think it's very relevant to uh, Turkey and all other countries, of course. Uh, now, our strategic and security environment is marked by new risks and challenges. Uh, they are uh, multifaceted uh, and very complex. I mean, if I look at the spectrum from, uh, I mean, the transatlantic and Eurasia, that geographic area, we see that most of the threats that we are facing, most of the challenges that we are facing are very similar, if not identical. Mm -hmm. And even the actors which are involved in those challenges and threats are very similar, identical, if not the same. Uh, but then uh, what is uh, very interesting is that you can look at one region uh, with a threat and certain actors certain alliances and then you go to another region with similar threats the same actors but different alliances uh, i mean uh, that by itself i think uh, demonstrates how complex the situation is uh, secondly of course uh, we have seen uh, by experience that every challenge that we have faced has led to another challenge with even bigger implications. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, intervention was not timely. We have not intervened timely in a timely manner. And we have not used the existing mechanisms in an efficient way. Now, we have the mechanisms, actually, to deal with uh, present challenges. Uh, none of us are uh, naive. Uh, in the United Nations, in uh, NATO, in other international organizations. We always keep watching what is happening. We gather information, we evaluate, we assess, and we develop new strategies. So what we need is not information. We have, we have lots of it. But what we lack is the willingness to act together because of different interests. Take United Nations, for example. United Nations 
is the leading organization to cope with uh, crisis, isn't it? Uh, to keep the world order or disorder, uh, as you just said. Uh, but is the United Nations uh, doing what it is supposed to do? No, because the existing system, huh, the existing system, uh, and the existing mechanisms do not respond to the needs and requirements of today. This is not an ideological statement, but it's a statement of fact. We have to modernize, let's say, United Nations in light of uh, the requirements of the present day. So we have to use existing tools, mechanisms in a much uh, efficient way. In order to do that, we have to uh, modernize them, to update them. Uh, that takes me to NATO. NATO is one of the major international organizations uh, which Turkey has been a member since 1952. We have been one of the frontline countries, one of the two frontline countries actually, during the Cold War. After the Cold War, we have taken all the responsibilities that an ally should take and more. And we think NATO today is very re relevant because it keeps renewing itself. Now, one may argue that uh, that's not enough. NATO, NATO is not uh, relevant enough. Well, nobody is perfect. No organization is perfect. But at least NATO has the willingness to adapt itself. And because of this ability to adapt itself, NATO keeps being relevant in the international security environment. Now, uh, as to Turkey, as I said, Turkey has been uh, a solid NATO ally since 1952. And there is no going back in that. We are going to be a solid NATO ally for the decades to come. If you look at NATO operations today, you will see that Turkey is one of the countries with most contributions in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Kosovo, in Bosnia. I mean, wherever there is a NATO operation or NATO engaged operation, Turkey is there with boots on the ground. You know, one should not uh, neglect the fact that Turkey uh, cannot afford to be theoretical. I mean, this is an example that we give all the time. If Turkey was, for example, uh, in the place of, I don't know, Luxembourg, that would be great. I mean, uh, this would allow us uh, to make very philosophical, uh, theoretical uh, contributions to uh, these kinds of events. But we are in the middle of uh, where we are. If you look at uh, the region that we uh, are in, are located in, I think 80% or 75% of all the conflicts that are going around in the world are around Turkey. I mean, we didn't choose that, but uh, this is how it is. So we have to take uh, the necessary precautions. Now, being a member of NATO, I mean, NATO is one of the main pillars of Turkish security policy. There is no change in that. Uh, as to the S-400s, now, we are in a region uh, where proliferation is the highest. I mean, if you look at countries around us, again, all of them have uh, all sorts of weapons, rockets, and so on. We need something to defend ourselves. I mean, the major responsibility of a state is to defend its borders and its people. And to do that, you have to either produce or obtain weapons for self-defense. Now, NATO provides defense for Turkey, as it has done with the deployment of patriots, at our borders for the last four or five years. But then we also have our national means. Now we are going to add to these national means. What we did was we wanted to purchase these uh, needs, military needs, but for one reason or another, we could not. So there was a seller who was willing to sell, and we went to this seller and we bought, we purchased the S-400. 
Now, does that diminish our loyalty to the alliance? Not at all. I mean, we are even strengthening NATO territory, if you ask me. Secondly, uh, this system of S-400s will be uh, a system by itself. I mean, it will be a national system. So I do not really see what harm this brings to the security of NATO or why it should open into question Turkey's membership in the alliance or its solidarity and its loyalty and so on. Ambassador, if I can pick up on something that you said, which also goes back to what Bobo was saying, was saying earlier, which again is divergence, divergence of interests, divergence of interests which reflects in the inability of United Nations to solve conflicts, help solve conflicts as it has done, uh, as it has done in the past. Uh, we'll come back to the S-400. I'm pretty sure in the questions from the room, I do want to go to, 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 uh, to Mr. Carmon, though, and also if you can connect um, to the issue of divergence, to the issue of a possible new order, disorder, to, to quote Bobo, um, but also do refer to a phenomenon which you have noticed, which is we are not talking as much as we used to talk about terrorism in Europe. Two years ago, everybody was, was scared, was threatened. This was the, the, the scare of the day that terrorists are going to, to, uh, to, to destroy Europe. And there was an attack, or there was talk about an attack every single day. This is not the case anymore. Is this because terrorism has decreased, or is this because Europe is consumed with something else? Good afternoon. Is it working? Yeah. Should be uh, working. I uh, try to speak about the uh, global uh, threat of terrorism, not only uh, Europe, uh, and uh, clearly the uh, uh, Middle East is the epicenter, uh, at least of the uh, uh, jihadist uh, uh, terrorism. And we saw only last week, after what happens in northern Syria, that all of a sudden there is a possibility and a threat and a worry that uh, ISIS will uh, revive. Uh, uh, perhaps will not form a, a caliphate, but it will be clearly a player again on the international uh, arena. Before going to explanation why today the threat is, has diminished, uh, clearly has diminished, I try uh, to uh, explain what, how, how Syria, the situation, the evolution of the situation in Syria has uh, uh, impacted on the development of this global threat because it was uh, local and then regional and then uh, uh, global. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Aspen Institute and uh, uh, the Marshall Fund for inviting me for this uh, prestigious uh, uh, forum. Uh, we are limited uh, to seven uh, minutes, I think, in our presentation. At the most. Yeah, and uh, uh, I was uh, once told by a Washington uh, uh, Institute director that if you speak 25, 50, 30 minutes in uh, Washington, uh, for public, you are very much appreciated. If you speak in 15 minutes, then you will be considered an excellent uh, lecturer or speaker. But if you speak in five minutes, the administration will recruit you, the American administration. <laughs> now, one minute already. No, no, okay. But now we, it's sufficient to have a tweet. Okay, we can with a tweet uh, change completely the global situation. Anyway, the situation in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Syria in uh, March 2011 began with a civil Pacific uprising which uh, quite quickly, uh, less than a year, uh, has transformed itself in a jihadist uh, uh, front, uh, not only against uh, Syria, against Iraq and against uh, the neighbors and the uh, world, if you want, especially in the West. Uh, now, how this happened is because, because that after a year, the United States and the West have our sorts, our sorts the conflict to three regional powers, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, which were involved deeply in uh, promoting uh, allies and the groups and the movements, and all of these uh, countries had converging, not converging, conflicting interests, strategic and political interests. So uh, after the first phase of uh, civil uh, uprising, you have a phase of production or uh, development of huge numbers of this kind of uh, organizations. I don't know if I have a, a map here because I was told that perhaps I can use, you, he, you have here the seat, but if you go, sorry. Okay, anyway, uh, this is the map of uh, Syria today. Uh, there were 
thousands of, dozens of uh, uh, groups, not only of the Sunni jihadists, but also of the uh, groups which supported uh, the regime of al-Assad, Christians, Palestinians, and clearly Hezbollah, Iranians, and their proxy in Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on. So this is the second phase which uh, led to the formation of the caliphate. Until 2015, when you have the attempt by the jihadists to take control, the control of the Idlib region and threatening the existence of the Alawites in Syria. And this is the moment that the Russian military intervention begins. And it changes completely. And what we see now on the map is the result of this military intervention. Now, although they want to control the Russians uh, by the government of uh, Bashar al-Assad of all the territory, in fact, they succeeded only two-thirds. And you see, uh, a third of it is controlled by, or was controlled at least, by the Kurdish forces with some tribal allies and the United States. The importance of this uh, uh, control was not only because it stopped and in the end it destroyed their territorial caliphate, but also because it stopped the possibility or the alternative that the Iranians use this corridor in order to uh, implant themselves in Syria. And therefore, uh, it was only, uh, not only uh, in the fight against terrorists, but also a strategic tool in order to stop the penetration of the Iranians. Turkey, because it has its own uh, interest, we see there in the north this uh, zone, uh, yellow zone, this was the interest of Turkey to try to stop a kind of autonomy of the Kurds because Turkey is afraid that uh, uh, the Kurds in the uh, Syrian autonomy will provoke a backlash, if you want, in Turkey itself and the rise of the PKK as a concurrent to the uh, Turkish state. By the way, you see that this is a Turkish uh, map, by the way, from uh, two, three weeks ago, but it doesn't mention the Russians. I put the Russians there because the Russians we see now are all of a sudden on the border with uh, uh, Turkey and Syria. Now, we are now entering the third, the fourth uh, phase with the uh, decision of President Trump to leave uh, Syria and the fact that uh, the uh, situation in this uh, third of Syria is not clear, ISIS could uh, become a, now again a serious force. Uh, not only we know that there are some 70,000 people arrested, there are women. We saw the camps of the uh, women in Syria, most of them are controlled by ISIS. We have at least 2,000, 3,000 fighters of ISIS arrested there. Some of them, 500, 600, have already escaped. And they can uh, reach the territory that we see in the West Idlib, which is a major threat, more important perhaps, because in the Idlib region you have uh, 3 million people, you have 25, 30,000 fighters of Al-Qaeda, not ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. And so you see, it's not only ISIS the, the, the problem. And nobody knows what will happen in the next weeks, and this involves also Turkey very, very uh, uh, I wouldn't, now, want, I wouldn't want to go into too much detail when it comes to Syria because, again, I'm pretty sure there are going to be questions uh, from, your, uh, from, why, from the why, why the threat do refer to the, larger, to the okay. larger security landscape. So the destruction of the caliphate uh, a year ago, actually, has diminished the possibility that foreign fighters return not only to Europe, to uh, uh, Northern Africa, to Australia, and so on. And this was the result uh, of two things. One is the American coalition and the Russian coalition have decided to kill, kill physically, in the fight for Mosul, for Raqqa and other cities, as much possible foreign fighters. By the way, in 2017, 1,100 have been killed foreign fighters, mainly Europeans, in suicide bombing, bombings. Second, the United European states, after three, four years of doing nothing, in order to stop this wave of export and now import, again, return of the foreign fighters, finally have decided on measures that limit this kind of return. But at the, at the same time, we see that the ISIS has uh, decided two strategic decisions. One is to go underground, a new insurgency, especially in Iraq, and now in Syria. And this is the problem. We will have a new insurgency. The second is to relocate well to relocate Afghanistan and Libya, the two territories where they can have some possibility of implanting themselves. It's very interesting in Afghanistan, for instance, because they are fighting Taliban. 
they succeeded in controlling some of the uh, northern eastern provinces. And uh, in the Idlib region, we, we have also uh, some 25, as I said, uh, thousand uh, fighters from where? Most of them from Central Asia, Uzbek, Tajik, Chechens, uh, Uyghurs. And all these people, if they will be uh, expelled by Russia or by Turkey, they will go where? In Central Asia. So this is a new wave that can influence the, the West. Thank you very much. You did refer to Russia and you actually put the, the Russian flag on the map. So um, I, I do want to come to, to Radu and to our part of the world with all this talk, not only on the panel, but in general on Syria, on Middle East, on Turkey. Um, is there a danger that the attention is focused southwards and, and the alliance and the transatlantic uh, community will forget about uh, Eastern Europe? Thank you, Alina. I think we are at the, that time of our life when we see uh, threat uh, with different definitions. I mean, uh, I'm not that pessimistic as uh, Bobo was, uh, was here. I think we are not in a world disorder because otherwise uh, we would not see United Nations, NATO, EU, and other strong institutions being so influential actors in the world. I think we have a, a small problem, a small argue, a small, let's say, uh, dispute in our own family, and I think we will overpass this problem. If uh, we see here in the eastern, eastern flank Russia as the biggest threat, and we have so many arguments to define Russia as an aggressor state, because Two military invasions and one illegal annexation of a portion of a state, that means military aggression. Georgia 2008, Ukraine 2014, and what is happening after that? With hybrid war and attacks on allied territories, on NATO soil. So, yes, we see Russia as the biggest threat. United States doesn't seem to realize that Russia could be also a huge danger for internal democracy in the United States. Right now, they see only China as a major uh, uh, challenger, but this is rather in a commercial or trade view when uh, this administration thinks that China is the biggest threat to the United States. So, I guess that the solution is to strengthen the institution I've been talking about. NATO, United Nations, European Union. Not to say that they are uh, um, less uh, uh, utile. Not to say that we don't have any solutions. We have the institutions. We have to give them strength to action as they did in the last 70 years. Right now, in this year, and in December, we'll have the summit in London. 70 years of NATO, which means peace, security, and democracy for an area that means right now one billion people. NATO is giving peace and security for one billion people. So if we need and want to ensure this peace and democracy in the next 70 years, then we should empower NATO. And I was listening very carefully the uh, speeches of our friend uh, from Turkey. I remember in 1999 when Turkey had a good help from Israel and from United States to capture Abdullah Ocalan in Kenya. It was a massive operation with CIA and Mossad involved to help our Turkish allies to get a leader of a terrorist organization, PKK. And I still believe that in such tension times, we can still find a solution. And those are not worse times than they were in 1966 when France left the military structure of NATO. There were not tougher times than when we saw military coup d'etat in Turkey in Greece during the Cold War. So, from my point of view, we should stay together at the same table, identify what threats means for our way of life, 
for our Western values, for our democracies. And at the end of the day, I think we will find a solution. We will put it on the table. We will all be together having the same effort to protect our territories and our populaces. Thank in you. The, in the meanwhile, though, there is a lot of volatility, there is a lot of disruption, there is a lot of divergence of interest, as everybody has been, has been uh, talking about. Um, and there are opponents out there who outsmart us, outpace us. I do want to go to the audience and take questions, uh, take questions to any or all of the panelists, and then I do want to discuss um, European defense with you as well. If you have a two finger, uh, a two okay. finger. I, w I wanted to come. Uh, sorry. I wanted to then, come yes. back on some of the points that Radu had made, but shall I wait or shall I do if that If it's a now? two finger, you can go ahead. If it's longer, okay, just very make quickly, it short. Just very quickly on multilateral organizations. You know, it's a strange paradox, isn't it? We have never had so many multilateral organizations and mechanisms in the world. We have never had a greater need for them. And yet, at the same time, they have rarely been more ineffectual. And I'm talking about both... Uh, well-established multilateral organizations and newer forms such as the sort of uh, AIIB, the sort of the, the whole Belt and Road Initiative, that a lot of this is actually, they exist on paper, they, they have a certain residual reputation, but their existence is being questioned, and not just by uh, countries outside the circle, but actually very much from within, by uh, political establishments, by society. So that really does concern me. I see the US-China um, conflict as much, much more than trade. We were talking about this in a previous session. It's not about trade. Trade is essentially a pretext. Trade, the trade dispute is emblematic of a much larger confrontation between Washington and Beijing. And you say, look, we need to strengthen NATO, the United Nations, the European Union. I am, even though I live in the UK, I absolutely agree with you. We, of course we need to strengthen it. But the question is how? There is, there are, you were talking about divergences before. There, there, these are not divergences that we're seeing on matters of mere detail. These are fundamental divergences of principle. Take NATO. We talk about NATO being established on the basis of shared values. What shared values? What shared values do we see between, say, Donald Trump and Angela Merkel? What shared values do we see, say, between Ankara and Paris? Or between Budapest and Madrid? I don't see them. I'm sorry. Fighting terrorism, ensuring peace in, but that's our, not shared in their values. own countries. That's, that's Le shared let's, not go, let's not go into, yeah. into a conversation here between, between the two of you. Uh, two fingers, which means very brief. Okay, three fingers. If you allow me, I want to make a few comments on the issue of terrorism, but on divergences. Uh, I mean, first we have to agree on uh, details. I mean, we have to agree what we are talking about. And then, upon that base, we have to renew or uh, modernize the mechanisms. Uh, but uh, my conclusion would be, which I'll say now, that every problem, so, which is uh, a problem of somebody, sooner or later, one way or another, becomes everybody else's problem. Take terrorism, yeah. take illegal immigration. So. Nobody can say, well, uh, I'm far away from the problem, it won't come to me. No, it will emerge on your doorstep. Now, on terrorism, unfortunately, in Syria there was a power vacuum after uh, March 2011. And I very well know, I was the ambassador in Syria then, how ISIS, as you call it, as I call it, Daesh, because ISIS implies Islam, and they don't represent Islam, how Daesh emerged. I know very well who really, I mean, we all know very well, not I, but who released them from the prison, who armed them, who did what, and so on. Now, these people, Daesh, they bombed Turkey, they conducted terror activities in Turkey, in Istanbul, in Ankara, in Diyarbakir, 
and other places, and we did not receive anything apart from official condolences. But when these people started to bomb Paris and Brussels, then the issue became a problem for all of us. Now, if we are going to build mechanisms, we should build mechanisms not based on a double-fested approach. Uh, so terrorism is terrorism, one. Secondly, Daesh is not the only terror organization in the region. PKK is a terror organization. And YPG, which is an extension of PKK, PYD, YPG, is a terror organization. Now, did they fight Daesh? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Why? Because they wanted to carve up Syria and who was present there? Daesh. Well, were they the only ones who fought with Daesh? No. Turkey is the only country, the only country which fought against Daesh on the ground. And with Operation uh, Euphrates Shield, we cleared 2,000 square kilometers of territory in northern Syria from Daesh. I mean, that's a fact. I, sorry, I want to say yeah. the following. Now, because PKK, I'm calling them PKK because that's what they are. Just because PKK fought with Daesh because of their own interests does not make them a good organization. Otherwise, Al-Qaeda would also be a good organization because they fought against Daesh also. You know, Al-Qaeda fought Daesh. So why is Al-Qaeda not a good organization? Can we say it is? No. It's a terror organization. Now, one last thing uh, I want to say, I'm very sorry. Uh, the foreign fighters, the foreign fighters, they are still in Syria. Uh, there are, I don't know, everybody has different numbers, but they say there are about 6,000, uh, 6, 6, 7,000 fighters plus tens of thousands of families of Daesh. Now, 40% of them or 35% of them are from Europe. They are European citizens, EU citizens. Why don't they take them back? I mean, they are their citizens. When a Frenchman, for example, is arrested on uh, stealing something in Turkey and he's in the prison, they ask for him. Uh, so to let give me get back. the gist of what you're saying and then turn it, turn it to the audience because you're still talking about lack of shared values, lack of shared interests, and different perceptions of threats. Um, you did have a two finger. Uh, uh, I I beg to uh, differ, uh, Mr. Ambassador. I won't enter in details. I won't enter this way because it takes Thank you. One, uh, one hour. But I'd like to refer to uh, uh, two issues. Uh, one, in the general framework, the threat of uh, dissolution in a way, or chaos in the internet and the social media. Mm -hmm. There is a huge uh, threat in it, the deep internet. Uh, our institute is working with Google, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube in trying to control at least uh, uh, partially, and we saw in Germany, the last attack in Germany by the extreme right, by the way, which is also very, very active on the internet, he uh, put a document already a week ago, and then he appeared 25 minutes on, uh, on the internet and nobody stopped him. Although there was already the uh, example of uh, New Zealand, where there he attacked a mosque for half an hour. The second is the issue of shifting alliances. What we see, by the way, inside, inside uh, uh, Iraq and Syria and in Yemen and between the local and the uh, global powers. Uh, kind of wave of shifting alliances. For uh, five years, I had all the presentations shifting alliances. Every six months. The fact that Turkey now is buying the S-400 and trying to buy Ch uh, Chinese weapons is not so simple. We know that there is uh, sensitive, uh, uh, sensitive technolo technology, that's why the United States decided not to sell the F-35 to, to, to Turkey. It's complicated. But the shifting of alliances means destabilization. Nobody can trust, not the United States, and I think not Russia, and not Turkey, and not NATO, because everybody is trying on the hour, okay, on the moment, if there is a problem, to change the alliances. So we see Putin today in Saudi Arabia and the uh, Emirates, okay, trying to so shifting alliance and general lack of trust. Questions from the audience, please, and please help me with the, with the microphones. General? 
The microphone is right there. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are uh, uh, witnessing here, it seems to me, a kind of uh, competitive uh, narratives. Uh, Mr. Law talked about the uh, disruption of uh, the liberal world in order and the construction of, uh, uh, of the new one. Radu is on the contrary, is considering that the institutions of the old order are already functioning. So my question is, for both of you, and also for uh, the other two participants in the panel. What do you consider that uh, there are the main tendencies of today? If we are going to replace the old order on a scale of one to 10, where we are in terms of replacing the old order, and for Radu, on the same scale, where do you consider that we would have to push in order to have uh, the old institutions be, uh, functioning uh, in the next uh, uh, decade, at least. Thank you. I will take uh, one more question and then go back to the panelists. Alexandra? It looks to me like we do have security vacuums and we see no Europeans or not very visible. So where are the Europeans in this shifting world order? Another question I can bundle with this too. The microphone is right there. Uh, I'll be speaking in the next panel, but it wouldn't be fair to uh, comment when the speakers are done. Uh, it's, it seems to me uh, the panel was very interesting, and I'm seeing a lot of a positional approaches of advocating interests, obviously. But then on the one hand, we're talking about all kinds of people going to fight in Syria, and our Turkish colleague from the ministry is coming from a country which has a territory through which all those people are going to Syria, uh, at least from North Caucasus and or the region that I come from. Uh, how, I mean, is it because you didn't have control over those territories? Because we have, uh, from Northern Caucasus, Islamic groups to whoever you can name it, how did they all end up there? Why was that route so possible and available for them? Okay, I'll start with Radu. Uh, one minute. Yes. I want to give again the example of NATO. This year we have 70 years. Uh, I guess one month ago, Mircea Joana said, which is now Deputy Secretary General of NATO, we have to renew our engagements. Like in the golden anniversary of the wedding. After 50 years, you will ask him, do you still love me? And she will ask him, do you still love me? And this is in the front of the priest. I mean, this Washington Treaty for 70 years really worked. So why do we want to throw something that is working so good and it proves peace and stability in the last 70 years? And if we have the secure and peaceful area for one billion people, United States, Canada, Europe, then we can have so many trade wars as we want. Because peace and security and stability and defense brings us all the good space to find solutions for any conflict or any dispute we have as long as there is not a war. Thank you. One to ten. The microphone, please. My point had been, uh, according to your narrative, that would mean that strengthening that kind of institution, we would have for at least a decade the world order uh, functioning. So where do you think that we are now on this kind of tendency which you already had explained? I will uh, answer you after the uh, London summit when I will see Donald Trump leaving for, you, you, for DC and uh, <laughs> saying that, okay, it was a good summit. Bye -bye. Can you move on to the next? Can you move on to the next panelist, Bobo? Okay, so replacing the world order, <clears throat> we are we are entering a, a post-American era. What I mean by that is a post-American global leadership era. But really, no one has a clear idea, least of all in America, about where this post-American era is leading. We know that the 
the liberal world order is falling apart, finds itself in an existential crisis. But there is no replacement world order in waiting, mainly perhaps because the Chinese themselves are the last people who want to try and institute a world order. Not because they're nice people, but because they don't want the burden of responsibility. They know everyone is going to hate their guts. So that's the last thing they want to do. They don't need the aggravation. So I think on the, on the route to a new world order, two, three, we're a long way away. Um, where are the Europeans in the world order? That's a great question, and I, I don't really have an answer. The future of the Europeans, for all the talk about strategic autonomy and all that sort of stuff, yeah, those are just words, those are just slogans. The future of the Europeans actually lies in some kind of transatlantic consensus. Now, obviously, the 2020 US presidential elections are going to be key, but they're not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough for someone not called Donald Trump to win in 2020. There has to be a fundamental rethinking of how the transatlantic uh, consensus, uh, alliance, uh, a world works, on what principles, what are the obligations, what are the rights and responsibilities. There has to be greater strategic flexibility within that uh, transatlantic alliance. On, diff on uh, the NATO summit, this is a classic case, because take Article 5, which you know, different NATO member states have very different understandings of what triggers Article 5, which brings me to the, the London summit. Um, talking to people, I ask them what, what their expectations are of a London summit. And there, I think, we do agree, because their, ex their hope, rather than their expectation, is that they get through the summit without a complete car crash. That's exactly what happened at the last summit as well, the expectation. <laughs> yes. If you want to answer any of the questions, I think one of the questions was addressed to you. What, what was it? I, I didn't hear. Can you repeat your question if you get your microphone? The question was, we're talking about very different radical Islamic groups gathering in Syria, and we know factually that a lot of those end up in Syria through Turkish territory, and especially when it comes to North Caucasus and our neighborhood. How, does, how is that happening? Are you not able to control those territories so they have free channel, or why is it happening? Uh, well, as you know, uh, Turkey, let us first uh, remember facts. One, Turkey has a 911 kilometer of border with Syria. Uh, so it is impossible to control every inch of that border, one fact. Secondly, Turkey is a country which receives 42 million tourists every year. Now, we have returned from our airports about, I have the numbers in the back, but uh, about 12,000 people that we suspected that could be coming to Turkey to pass to Syria to join Daesh. So we returned them back. But most of these people, by the way, later appeared uh, in Syria, either killed or captured or whatever. Why? Syria has three more neighbors. Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq. So please bear this in mind. In uh, our prisons, we have about 5,000 Daesh members, many of them arrested, trying to enter Turkey. Now, I have to say two things here. One, uh, when this threat emerged, I mean, when foreign fighters, as we call them, started to pour into Syria, we ask the European partners to help us. I mean, if you have any indication of a certain person being affiliated to that organization, let us know. And they said, we cannot do that. Why? Because we cannot restrict a citizen's freedom of travel. And they wanted us to pick them up, but you can only pick them up if you know about them. So, unfortunately, at the very beginning, there was no uh, international cooperation. Uh, I have to uh, remind. One more thing. Uh, 
I was going to say something. Huh? Uh, the tourists, 40 million tourists. Some of the Daesh militants which came into Turkey and went into Syria, you know how they did it? They came as tourists, no beard, no nothing, uh, very liberal. They went to five-star hotels in Antalya, had a nice two, three days over there. And then, uh, above any suspicion, mm -hmm. they went to the border and then into Syria, those who couldn't pass. So, uh, please remember the fish that we caught, uh, but also there is fish that also went in. But nobody can say Turkey did nothing to prevent Daesh from infiltrating into Syria. Yeah. Uh, on the strategic level, I think uh, we are uh, passing through a, a dual uh, balance of power, of the Cold War. Uh, one power, hegemonic power, United States, to a multi-power fight, which is not defined, like the 19th century. Uh, I think, by the way, that China has a very clear vision what they want to achieve. They want to achieve really global power, but they are very cautious and they prepare because they know that they are still, we are not the uh, strongest military, uh, uh, the military uh, force. I think, by the way, that China is more of a threat to Russia than to the United States. We can see very, uh, very soon, perhaps, an alliance between Russia and the United States because China is a heavyweight on the Siberian territory, and we see the economic and even demographic activity of Chinese in Siberia. So uh, this uh, lack of, uh, of uh, balance of power uh, clearly will bring, uh, in my opinion, quite a long uh, period of instability, instability. And nobody knows, because at, at least on the American side, they don't know what they want. Uh, Trump clearly does not want exactly what, the, what he wants, and he has an uh, administration. I know that 80-90% of the administration, what uh, uh, Mr. President Erdogan calls the deep state, is opposed to what uh, President Trump is doing. So uh, we have to see what happens with the elections in the United States, uh, what happens, by the way, with the Russians in the Middle East, which are advancing quite uh, uh, quickly, and with the Chinese, by the way, the uh, only ones, in my uh, opinion, that can reconstruct Syria. I do want to bring this panel to an end because I have to move directly into the next panel and some of the issues I'm pretty sure will be, will be uh, 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 caught upon. Um, I, but I think we had a pretty good sample of the divergences which exist within the alliance, um, outside of the alliance. There seems to be only one um, uh, point, uh, one point of, of, of interest, of common interest, which is China. Everybody agrees that China is, is a big threat, except for Bobo, who wants to say something on this, and yes. you have the final word. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I do feel that in the West, there is this sort of mystification of Chinese wisdom and far-sightedness and all that sort of thing. Um, the Chinese are as nakedly opportunistic as Western politicians, if not more so. So please let us demystify the Chinese and say, oh my word, they're so wise, you know, thousands of years civilization. This is frankly mumbo jumbo. Now, the, uh, you say that China wants to be, <laughs> dominate the world. But what do you mean by that? What's your evidence for the Chinese wanting to dominate the world? Yes, they want to, they want to modernize. Yes, they want to expand their influence. But they want to be the global hegemon with all the aggravation and responsibility that involves. It wants to replace the United States. I don't think there's the remotest bit of evidence for that. And finally, on the US, China, Russia, so-called strategic triangle, you know, it is funny because uh, the Chinese do, uh, some Chinese are worried that somehow Donald Trump will seduce Vladimir Putin into bringing Russia onto the American side. But this is nonsense, I'm afraid. Because what, Donald, what Putin sees in Donald Trump, he sees someone that we actually recognize as utterly unreliable. So he knows he's not going to, he likes Trump's disruptive effect on the transatlantic alliance. But he doesn't trust Donald Trump as far as he could kick him. And plus, the Russians also know that the American political defense establishment 
are very, very firmly set against the Kremlin. So in other words, you've got an establishment that hates you as Russia, at least that's their perception, and you have a president who's utterly unreliable. Why on earth would they switch from the Chinese who for all their faults have shown you know, that they're reasonably trustworthy strategic partners to jumping into the complete unknown with a bunch of people who hate you and a president who you can't trust. I On don't see the logic. On this mumbo-jumbo and nonsense note, I will end this panel because we need to move on to the next one. Please join me in thanking the panelists and their passion. Thank you for the panelists. We will move from Middle East to another uh, geography, to Black Sea, and uh, we will invite uh, a new uh, team of uh, panelists here. Okay, hello. Can you can everyone hear me? I think we'd better get going because we're the last uh, panel of the day and we're already running late. Um, and we've got exactly an hour, so I won't take too long to um, introduce this panel, which actually, although it's about the greater Black Sea area, Caspian, Black Sea, and Mediterranean, it does, uh, as um, uh, Alina uh, hinted, it does kind of... Uh, flow, I think, really from the last panel, and we can continue it a bit about on, on some of the same uh, topics of the, of the last uh, panel. Um, perhaps one of the things that we can talk about is that uh, um, is how the world or how, how, how the world looks today from small countries and 
obviously Ukraine is not a small country, but it's also a country uh, at, at, at war. And I have to say that I think that uh, what we haven't discussed really very much in this um, in in this edition of the Bucharest Forum is some of the events of the last week, especially which flow from Syria. I mean, it's been talked about a little bit, but. Uh, I think one of the most um, one of the, the videos that I've seen, like everybody else, in the last uh, week of uh, uh, I think of, uh, of American uh, military hardware uh, passing on the road, uh, uh, Syrian or, or, or Russian uh, hardware going the other way, and uh, Russian journalists. Uh, in bases that the Americans had retreated from in the last uh, week. Um, I think that those are things which we're going to, I imagine, are going to have uh, quite a bit of influence um, in the world, and especially for uh, small states and for countries that uh, um, are looking to, uh, to the US and to, to the West for um, protection uh, and for uh, leadership. Um, so, uh, let us, let's start with um, Alexander Iskandarian, your director of the um, Caucasus Institute. Um, Armenia has, over the past few years, changed tack. I mean, you were uh, moving to wholeheartedly towards the EU, towards Europe, uh, then you kind of changed tack towards uh, Russia, you know, now where are you and how does it look from uh, Yerevan today? Uh, thank you. It's not even just about Armenia, I would say. It's not, it's just, no, of course, South it's about... Caucasus, well, South Caucasus by uh, its nature is a region of uh, small or not very big countries surrounded by big, big uh, neighbors. Uh, South Caucasus altogether, I mean, uh, Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan is by territory less than Romania. By population, it's approximately like Netherlands, all three countries. But it's quite important region. We are in between. We, we are in between. Uh, Russia from the north and Iran and Turkey from the south and, and, and Central Asia from uh, east and Europe from, from, the, yes, uh, from the west. So uh, what I'm going to try to, to show you, it's uh, not just a view from Armenia, but I will come back to Armenia uh, as well. I would say that after World War II, uh, there was a unique time uh, in history when the Warsaw Bloc and the NATO divided up uh, the world. Uh, in this bipolar world, competition between any, uh, any two subjects would become a proxy conflict, proxy conflict between the two superpowers. The rules of the game were set and so was the price of breaking them. In Angola, I don't know, Czechoslovakia or Palestine, the interests of the parties in conflict uh, followed the logic of bipolar world order. Just as hundreds of years before the global uh, divide passed through the Black Sea, the Black Sea region has a, was a watershed. The resulting layout was weird at times. Turkey. Uh, for example, that joined the NATO, and no one went into detail in 1952, uh, and no one went into details because Turkey's geographical situation uh, made its membership essential for the NATO. Romania was a uh, in a peculiar situation both inside the Warsaw Bloc, I would say, and outside Warsaw Bloc. The Moldovan Soviet uh, Socialist Republic was established uh, as Stalin's way of telling Romania that alternative forms of statehood, I would say, were also possible. The Black Sea region was an important stretch of the global divide, as can be seen uh, from many facts, including nuclear weapons uh, in the territory of Ukraine, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, uh, and the U.S. air uh, base in Injerlik, uh, Turkey. It's been 30 years uh, since the USSR uh, dis disintegrated. However, despite native hopes, the Black Sea did not automatically become a region for cooperation and uh, interaction. 
uh, true, the threat of global nuclear war uh, does not appear realistic anymore. Russia is not USSR and, and certainly not the Warsaw Pact. Borders are open, people travel all across the region. Uh, Turkey is uh, flooded by Russian speaking tourists. Uh, I don't know, ferries running from Constanza and Varna to, to Batumi and Poti are part of the everyday routine of Georgian, Armenian, and Azerbaijani drivers. However, there aren't fewer conflicts now. Uh, in fact, there are more. The region's uh, sealed borders may look less impressive than the borders of the former USSR with their barbed wire and uh, missile launchers. Yet it's impossible to travel directly, for example, from Suhumi to Kutaisi, both towns are in, in internationally recognized territory of Republic of Georgia, or from Tsinvali to, to Tbilisi, which is just about 40 kilometers inside uh, internationally recognized territory of Georgia. You cannot go from Armenia to Turkey directly. Uh, border is closed. You cannot go from Karabakh to Azerbaijan. Uh, some of the conflicts, such as ones in Donbas uh, and Nagorno-Karabakh, aren't even full, fully frozen. People still get killed, uh, killed there. The difference is that the modern conflicts no longer uh, embody the differences between global competitors the way they did during the Cold War. I would say the new conflict depends more on the local context. In the case of, for example, Eastern Ukraine, uh, I think it is more or less clear which party in conflict uh, is a proxy for which global power. But for example, in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh, it's not. Uh, there is no clear, universal, simple order, and I doubt that will be one, certainly not for the coming years, maybe even decades. Also, it's uh, certain that no external power can bring peace and order to, to our region, Black Sea region, I mean, not, not just uh, Caucasus. The regional players themselves will, not, uh, will need to find opportunities to normalize uh, relations. Uh, it might seem impossible in some of the conflicts. However, all conflicts have a beginning and then and the end when they are transformed or settled. Solutions will be needed for each conflict in particular and for the region in general. Uh, it won't be easy. For example, my country, Armenia, you asked about that. Uh, my country is sandwiched between Iran and Georgia, two countries involved in complicated relationships with great powers. Uh, Iran with the United States, uh, Georgia with Russia. Armenia, from where it stands, needs to re recall with all these players, Georgia, Iran, to, uh, uh, Russia, and the West, the United States. Uh, our other neighbors are uh, Azerbaijan, which, uh, with which we have uh, unsettled ongoing conflict, and Turkey that supports Azerbaijan, so they are close for us. This leaves our media little room for maneuvers. Whatever one's intention, one cannot ignore the elephant in the room. What our media is doing is trying to unite instead of dividing and to avoid becoming a butterfly. They require Sorry, consensus. Sorry, becoming a what? Butterfly. Aha, yeah, okay. <laughs> the, 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 Require, this requires consensus with all players. You have to do that. This, in its turn, requires learning being pro-Western without being anti-Russian and pro-Russian without being pro-Western. This is uh, Armenia's answer to the challenges, uh, to challenge uh, of living in divided regions. So far, is the best, and I would say only possible answer we can give to your question. In other words, so there's not much, well, I mean, there's not much you can, can, can do, really. I mean, you're trapped in your situation, you're trapped geographically, and you just have to make the best of a bad job, in other I think words. So. I, think I mean, so. as simple as that. I, mean, I think so. The, the re real choice, it's not because we are smarter than others, or I, I don't know, better than others. You, 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 just, uh, you just live in the region you live. We are not as one of the 
previous speakers said we are not in Luxembourg. We are not between Belgium and. You are not. So actually, this is a this is a, a good this is a good point to 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 pass to um, Arsen Khatarian, and okay, former advisor on foreign relations to the Prime Minister of Armenia. You do have to live in your region. However, as we were talking about last night, uh, you are the only country, uh, if I understand correctly, um, to have sent troops under the Russian umbrella to um, Syria. So you do have. Well, I don't know, if that's freedom of movement, you have your own interests, Armenian interests, in, in, in diaspora interests in Syria, keeping the Russians happy uh, as well. Um, but as I say, you do have some kind of limited room for maneuver. Um, perhaps there should have been on, on, on the map that we saw there, that there should have been a very small um, little Armenian flag. Um, that we what? saw the Syria before, which is a little on, on, on Aleppo. But I mean, I don't think people are, I mean, I certainly wasn't really aware that Armenian soldiers are in, 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 in Syria. I think this is, you know, an interesting topic. So let, what let does us, this say for us, Armenian foreign policy? Let us, let us clarify first. It's not soldiers, it's military doctors and deminers. Two different things. Yeah, Very important still, to note. Uh, they're still soldiers. Uh, you can they're not fighting. Okay, you you want to call something, okay. I'm saying okay. what it is. Uh, right. The contingency is small, and we do have two very specific points that we make with this. One is moral and one is political. Right. We have legitimate stakes in Syria. On the one hand, because we have quite a large Armenian community that has been suffering there, and this community by and large appeared there 100 years ago because another aggressive move of uh, Turkey that is now invading Syria again. On the other hand, that's the moral part, uh, there, is, there is the moral part of us saying thanks to the Syrian people who have helped and hosted us back in the day 100 years ago with our doctors trying to help people. This is very important to mention. Huh? So let's not make it a military presence. If you want to put a flag there, uh, you can, but add a little doctor's sign there too. Okay. Um, on, the second, uh, on, on the second note, uh, yes, uh, we do have uh, presence in, 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 in different areas. Uh, Armenia is continuing its partnership with NATO. We were at the summit in, in, in Brussels last year. We are with the Partnership for Peace. We're in Afghanistan. We are partially in Iraq. Um, we continue being within the Lebanese peacekeeping forces. So uh, to the degree possible, we're trying to diversify our, uh, of course, institutional and other involvement to security alliances. But by large, the, the big security alliance that we're a member of is CSTO. Russia led CSTO, which had a secretary general who we basically fired last year. He was Armenian. He was there, and he's going through a criminal case in Armenia because of our revolution, which I believe is impacting that organization itself. Um, there is a lot of interesting things happening after what happened in 2018 in Armenia, the Velvet Revolution that we had, and I believe that these are very, very important and noteworthy processes that are actually up, uh, having an impact on the larger region, and that is uh, formal Soviet space. What are the most space. important ones? Of the, what are the most important things that will play out as the, a result of the revolution? The, the nonviolence nature of it on the first hand, uh, and the fact that this is possible. I was telling, that I, I'm coming from Prague, from uh, Forum 2000, where we were talking about 30 years of the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia. What we're saying is there are a lot of democracy spoilers in the neighborhood that are actually quite concerned about Armenia's success. Because if we're successful, that means it can happen to them as well. It's in the immediate neighborhood of South Caucasus and the larger former Soviet space. Uh, look at the changes in Kazakhstan. Look at other models of changes that I believe, in a way, may be a preventive measure not to have the same destiny as we, we we're witnessing in Armenia. On the other hand, uh, we're talking about larger Black Sea uh, and or cooperation in different areas. Talk, you, you posed the question about Armenia's aspiration with the European Union, etc. I mean, we have to clarify this very, very vividly. Huh? Until 2013, that's clear, Armenia was negotiating the CFTA, an association agreement with the European Union, together with Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. Um, the U-turn that Armenia made was obviously a shock for everyone, including for myself as a part of a civil society back then, who was opposed about the decision that was made with the previous regime. However, uh, one thing that needs to be clarified, Armenians started negotiating with the European Union, specifically the economic part of it, the customs part of it, because we were originally not invited to the club. The Eurasian Union club was not inviting Armenia. And the argument for that was because we didn't have a border with Russia or Kazakhstan or Belarus. Then, when we started negotiating with the European Union and got to the point when we were about to sign, 
uh, they, they made a deal within the founding states and suggested that Armenia can join the Eurasian Economic Union. So Armenia chose to, to, to make that move. Then, of course, EU and Brussels was pissed, many others were for good reason. However, we reformed and started negotiating the political part of the, uh, the, the association agreement and ended up signing another agreement with the European Union called SEPA, huh? Comprehensive and Partnership Agreement with the EU in 2017. One thing that I want to note here, and many have been criticizing Armenia for making these moves, a lot of the uh, large and small players in the neighborhood have been benefiting from this. Uh, three years ago, when the uh, Turkish aircraft, when the Russian aircraft was shut down and Russia pushed sanctions against Turkey, Turkish tomatoes were entering Armenia, were being uh, and re being re-exported re 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 to Russia. 2014, Armenia exported seven times more tomatoes than the year before. Similarly, our Georgian colleagues have been using Armenia space to actually bring in goods and re-export it to Russia, using this channel to actually benefit. Business always finds ways to do it. I'm not talking about state level, I'm talking about businesses here. So when we talk about uh, generally criticizing this or that move or this or that type of inter uh, integration, uh, and at the same time benefiting from uh, our territory, and, and, and to be frank here, of course, uh, Armenia is still enjoying the GSP plus with the European Union, which is quite a large number of goods that we're exporting with our customs. Uh, but Georgia, which has the, uh, the association and the, the CFTA, the free trade agreement, um, has a lot of the goods that it doesn't really produce enough. So colleagues in Turkey are come in, produce goods in Georgia, and under Made in Georgia, export it to Europe. These are things that we need to talk about. Everybody is trying to benefit from the situation where we are when it comes to trade, when it comes to business. Uh, I don't want to go too long, and I'm sure the crowd is tired. Yeah. I want to thank everyone for staying this long. I just may, will make a couple of points, especially when yeah, it comes to the Black Sea. Uh, I believe that one of the areas that is not being valued enough and or discussed enough is environment. I believe that the Black Sea, the contamination of the Black Sea has been a huge problem, has been going on for uh, the, yes. the decades now. And I think there is a, a, a lot of value that we can actually bring into the table if we start discussing some kind of joint work on the Black Sea contamination. The 11 countries and the unrecognized entities. Same Abkhazia, same others, who, which are, or, or Crimea for that matter, could come around the table because this is a common challenge. This is a challenge and a problem that we all need to solve anyways. And that could be an interesting ground that could bring people together rather than divide the way that we have been going on for now, until now. I think this is something that bears and carries a lot of value that we are not giving enough space and territory. We, in Armenia, have been trying to host different types of dialogues around the Black Sea environmental issues, inviting our uh, Georgian Abkhaz, Ukrainian, Russian, and other friends and colleagues, and creating a common space where people can talk. So let's try to dialogue based on the challenges that the Black Sea poses to the countries, find ways to do stuff together and cooperate besides the dividing, the fighting, the continuous, uh, I would say, uh, escalating problems on the Black Sea and the larger Black Sea area. Thank you. Great, okay, well that's, thank you very, thank you, thank you very much. Um, actually, that's a, that's a sort of good moment to, to move to you, Vasil. Vasil Sikuro, um, no, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Sikarulidze. Is that? Okay, thank you, Chairman of the Atlantic Council uh, of Georgia. Um, Is it concentrating, on? Yes, concentrating on, on things that can be agreed upon rather than talking about things that, that, that can't be agreed upon. And, uh, you know, your, your country is still kind of kind of much more western oriented than 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 than, than armenia does did you do you panic when you see uh mr trump on video on on, on twitter and um problems within the eu do you think that there's kind of like well there's kind of like we've got to look after ourselves and if that means talking to the russians and uh maybe compromising a, uh, doing things we don't want to do then perhaps we've got to do that i mean how does it look from your from where you are well yeah, let's uh, start from a U.S. role, if I yeah. Yeah. interpreting your question in the right way. So an important thing is that, as you mentioned, that Georgia's, uh, well, uh, about 70% of Georgian population, according to the last polls, are supporting Georgia's NATO integration, which is more than support for 
all political parties combined. Um, and then this is the one of the main strengths, in my opinion, of, uh, of the, of the pro-Western vector uh, in, in Georgia. As of U.S. role, U.S., I mean, it's very difficult to overestimate the role U.S. played in the region, and then especially in the transformation of Georgia, in, uh, uh, in the Georgian transformation in the, on, on the most reforms. Um, uh, that have been conducted in Georgia uh, with regard of the modernization and then, then uh, the, the defense uh, institution building and then um, uh, uh, good governance, democratization and all, all these uh, things. Uh, we have to admit that uh, the last president with, uh, the, uh, that believed in a uh, modern understanding, in, uh, in, uh, in American exceptionalism, in the modern understanding of this world, which I mean, what I mean by that is that um, uh, defining U.S. national interest beyond immediate economic and political needs was uh, George W. Bush. Since then, I mean, the, uh, well, uh, this, uh, was the slight change in their uh, in U.S. policy with regard of our region, uh, and then especially uh, U.S. support for the NATO further integration or, or NATO uh, enlargement. Uh, yes, there are certainly um, uh, issues that uh, makes us nervous, especially the 10-year delay, delay on the NATO integration. It, it has been kind of frozen, but uh, and then, of course, it uh, plays uh, uh, well not really good role for 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 for, for Georgia, but also it uh, sends um, kind of wrong signal uh, that NATO has been uh, well. It de it depends how how different countries interpret different signals. And then, in 2008, after Bucharest summit, and uh, when the decision was taken that Ukraine and Georgia will become NATO members. And, uh, uh, and uh, well, uh, it, we, which is more than membership action plan, but membership, uh, well, there was no agreement on the membership action plan. This was interpreted by Putin as a disunity among allies. And then it was also interpreted by Putin as a signal to move ahead and then start the, the uh, open military uh, operation. But how, the, despite of this, I mean, I, I'm not seeing it as a beginning of uh, the Russian intervention in Georgia. Though we had uh, other components of the hybrid war on place, starting from 2006, such as a cut of uh, the natural gas supply, cut of the trade, embargo on Georgian production to the Russian market, and the penetration of the Russian special services into the Georgian institutions, all this, but with the good policies. Of course, this hybrid war is uh, uh, hard to fight, but it requires holistic approach, holistic strat strategy to counter it. Uh, but it continues uh, with the occupation of Georgian territories, with the uh, uh, annexation of Crimea, with the ongoing war in Donbas region. Russia, it's not the only components of the hybrid war that Russia is fighting against the, uh, uh, its, its neighbors. There are also other components, such as the uh, issues related with trade, with corruption, with the penetration of uh, the special services into, into the institutions, and um, uh, and then uh, and then of course uh, of course the propaganda, propaganda uh, that is aimed to undermine trust in democracy, in freedom, and in the democratic institutions and the process, and then in in, in certain. We can say with a certainty that they were partially successful because, uh, again, to fight this hybrid war, there is the need for the holistic strategy. The strategy we see currently is kind of as a, it looks like as an ancient uh, palimpsest recovered by archaeologists, where we can see the script here and the script there, and then there are also the white spots. Uh, so, there are the positive steps made, such as uh, 
uh, deployment of U.S. troops in uh, Baltic countries, in Romania. They are a uh, uh, more serious uh, approach towards selling their weaponry and especially the defensive weapons to Ukraine, to Georgia. But I think it's incomplete. Then, then I, need, uh, I think there is the, the, the uh, serious need for other components of the strategy to support democratization, good governance, the, uh, support the reforms, support uh, uh, and create incentives uh, for, for internal reforms. Of course, uh, I do not believe in uh, imposing democracy, but I do believe in uh, 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 supporting democratic transformation. Uh, of course, but we've, but we've uh, some of these things are, are, have become stripped back to the bone. Uh, what I mean by that is, for example, um, Put, you, you were talking about um, Putin interpreted uh, messages in 2008 and did what he did. What happens if he now thinks, hmm, I mean, if, uh, if Mr. Trump thinks that uh, the Turks and Kurds have been fighting for thousands of years over bits of land, it's nothing to do with us. Well, what happens if um, Mr. Putin decides tomorrow, for the sake of argument, I'm not saying he's going to do this, decides um, the people of Abkhazia will now appeal to Russia and the people of uh, South Asia will now appeal to Russia to be, it, become part of the Russian Federation and go ahead and do that because actually Trump's not going to do anything and he thinks this is somewhere far away which he knows little and cares, cares little. There's just there's nothing you can do about it. And well, uh, they had, uh, well, uh, in Abkhazia, they had uh, uh, effective control and an illegal military presence on the soil for a long time. Exactly. Not starting, not, not in, two, in 2008. Of I course. think what would they do Actually, and what, uh, uh, what I'm afraid more than, than annexation of the occupied territories is that somehow to, to look and then try use different uh, uh, tools to somehow justify their occupation of Abkhazia and Ossetia by bring, trying to invent different uh, formats and um, the different kind of dialogues that where they would try to assert Abkhazia or, or South Ossetia by, by, while bringing other, other players around. But I think that they, they failed on our recognition, and then I think it's a good story, good, good, good news for us. What to, could we do if they decide, yeah, well, there is a little we can do, uh, actually, but uh, uh, Russians are responding to the incentives. They are uh, militant, power, they are attacking uh, many, uh, well, that they are challenging uh, liberal order, uh, they decided to uh, review uh, uh, post-Cold War order, but uh, they also respond to the incentives and do, they do respond to, uh, to the uh, challenges. And uh, I think that the, the, the best way to contain Russia at the center uh, uh, nowadays is that to rise political costs of what they are doing in Georgia, in Ukraine, in, in, in other countries as well, because this hybrid war is not limited with Ukraine or Georgia. Of course, but as I said, what have we seen in the last week? We've seen Russians in camps where the Americans have retreated from. So how can we believe in, in that anymore? If I was a Georgian, I would go like, well, you know, Washington's yeah. a long well, way away. Like, I mean, it's, this is the, well, unfortunately where we are, but we have to talk about it. You, you know? described it uh, pretty correctly. That uh, it's uh, really very hard to see for for, for that uh, that uh, yeah, Russians are. Well, uh, are they winning? Are they really winning? I don't know. I mean, it just. Uh, well, they're winning look, in Syria. Yeah. Well, mm. it looks like that uh, there are, there is no countering strategy. The strategy that would counter Russian assertiveness and then their attempts to change the world order and, uh, and then liberal order, especially in Europe. Okay. Uh, including uh, well, the, what they are doing in, in, in Syria. Okay. Hannah, Hannah Schles, your editor in chief of Ukraine Analytica and uh, a lot more, and are from Odessa. Um, I mean, I, I've described what I, I think the kind of the, the 
the kind of inadvertent signaling we've had from 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 Trump uh, uh, over uh, Syria. But for you, I mean, it's a, it's a lot worse, isn't it? I mean, the the president rings up and for, for, sorry, turns off the arms. But you need to defend yourself. You need to defend yourself for people to stay alive. In a in in a, you know a real a shooting war, he turns it off because he wants to help win elections in the U.S. If I was a Ukrainian, I'd go. These are not people we can rely on. Um, I'd be pretty worried if I was you. You know, we've been worrying for so many uh, years, if not centuries, that probably we became quite a sick. Um, uh, in these uh, emotions, and uh, uh, here, uh, like after my colleagues were talking and your question about Syria, I just realized that one phrase was just ringing in my head all the time, that Russians are winning when we are stopped fighting. And when I say fighting, it doesn't mean only military, but we, when we are not opposing. What happened in Syria, it is exactly, they started to win there after so many years of being present there, only when Americans said that they're going out. So as soon as they didn't have any opposition, uh, the same we witnessed, for example, in the Ukrainian case, because the real war, I mean, the military, the hot war is in the eastern Ukraine, but when you go to the whole territory of Ukraine, the war also exists. It's just different type of the cyber war, of the information war, of the economic war. And here as well, we were witnessing, like, as soon as we started to fight the cyber, uh, we were probably the only country this year they didn't have difficulties during the elections uh, because they were attacked against the central election system, but they were successfully uh, prevented. So we are learning, we are fighting back, only in this case we are not allowing other side uh, to win. And here when you are coming like, to make a bridge to the US situation, uh, definitely the last month was crazy for us with all these um, testimonies that are now happening with the very controversial statements of the US administration. But at the same time, it seems to me that um, we as the uh, uh, Ukraine, Georgia, uh, Moldova, we should not limit the United States only to the White House or on to uh, the personality of the president. Because exactly the situation with the military support and with this blackmailing demonstrated wonderful thing that Pentagon was in support of Ukraine, State Department was in support of uh, delivering these military assistance, Congress, both Democrats and Republicans were in support. And they uh, pressed and they were against the White House uh, that decided not to sign the final uh, signature over there. So that makes us a little bit more optimistic, but not panic, as you propose, because we understand that uh, the United States is a little bit more than just the personality of the president, that sometimes system works uh, much more... Um, sound-minded, if you can say it like this, and uh, there are counterbalances to some crazy decisions. However, unfortunately, we definitely can't be completely relaxed, but that's also uh, make us a perfect uh, uh, lesson that uh, when it is your security, you're the first responsible for it. You can definitely dream about the all support of all NATO members of the United States, of wherever you want, but at the final moment of fighting, it is only you, your army, your state apparatus, your society that are either able to protect your country and sovereignty of your country or not uh, able to do it. Great, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got about uh, 20, 20, 20 minutes, uh, okay? Uh, uh, probably we should have like a, a little group of three, three questions or comments. Keep it short and uh, please just introduce yourself. Uh, Uh, we've got three here, okay. No. okay. It works, it works. I have a brief question for Hanna. Uh, Sorin Yonitsa from Expert Forum or Think Tank from Bucharest. Uh, nice to see you again. We've met several other times. Um, it's about what happened in the last few weeks around Ukraine, but also it concerns Moldova and the region of Transnistria. Let's forget about Trump. It's about Europeans and Russia. What do you make of this, uh, all this noise 
uh, about um, finding a formula for Donbass and then for Transnistria in Moldova, the Steinmeier formula. All the discussions are suddenly uh, intensified and they come from both directions, Moscow, but also from, uh, from the Europeans, from Berlin. So the question is, uh, you are there in the middle of things, we are just observers from outside. Are we too paranoid? Do they really coordinate Europeans? Are they really up to something? And if yes, what is the order, the sequence? Do they want to push you first, or they are going to push the Moldavian first to create a precedent with Transnistria and then push you with this precedent on Donbass? And finally, uh, where is President Zelensky staying on this? Because, uh, again, from outside, we see these statements in the last weeks. He said something, he part, sort of retracted. Is there a plan? What, what, how do you interpret his position? Great, uh, okay. The Who, who's next? Come on, somebody else. Okay, please. Yeah, yeah just go briefly, go ahead. I would like not uh, to ex uh, defend, but to uh, explain the position of Russia. Uh, at the beginning of the American uh, offensive in Afghanistan after 9-11, Russia has provided military bases and open space to Americans, to Americans to enter Afghanistan from the north. Without this, they couldn't enter Afghanistan because there was already a problem with the Pakistanis. Second, in 2005, Putin visits Bush, President Bush, and is considered to be the best friend of Bush. What happens half a year or one year after that, Bush and NATO decide to post the uh, radar that uh, should uh, control the Iranian uh, program and missiles in Czechoslovakia and in Poland. And also decides, I think, in Bucharest, uh, the uh, uh, expansion of NATO to uh, Georgia and to Ukraine. This is seen as a betrayal, personal betrayal, first of all, but as a strategic threat. Because the Russians, by the way, proposed to the Americans, you want to fight the radar uh, against Iran, we'll give you an Azerbaijan radar on the f uh, border with uh, Iran. And the uh, Americans sent their delegation of generals and said, this is not good for us. And by the way, the Iranians almost bombed this rad Russian radar in Azerbaijan. Okay. So you see that Russia saw itself as a betrayed nation, great nation, okay? So all of a sudden, NATO and United States want to encircle Russia. And I think they had, as a, from their point of view, as a potential great power or ex-great power, uh, they had some right to, to be behind okay, this. Fine. Well, I don't know. Probably Hannah might want to pick up on that as well. I don't know. Like, uh, uh, who, somebody else? But, I just uh, want to add I would like to, to have one more, one more qu question or comment before. Please. Okay. Gentleman over there. Good afternoon, Maris Pomesco from National Defense University here in Bucharest. Uh, I take advantage to have uh, this uh, guest on the, on the table, and I am asking you something related to Armenia approach in western side and eastern side, because uh, you told us that when you, are, you are together with Russian Federation, the other side asks you what you're doing there, and vice versa. And uh, this is very useful for, for the other countries that are mainly against one side because they are problems they have problems with, with some national interest so if we have to link to the values that uh, were presented before this panel in the previous panel because we said at the end we do not have the same values even within some multinational organizations if you can nominate as an armenian country one value and one interest that you use in order to cooperate with West and one value and one interest that you use to cooperate with Russian Federation. This way, maybe we can help to understand how we can approach in common values for the next multinational organizations and to have the energy to cooperate together. Thank you. Okay, well, um, Hannah, the first question was for you about the Steinmeier plan. And uh, then I don't know if somebody would like to, to pick up on the question of uh, the great power feeding encircled. And then third question for, for for Armenia. Okay. Thank you. First of all, just uh, one phrase uh, to the Ellie, uh, because it really caught my attention that Russians felt betrayal uh, by the US. Honestly, where in this phrase is Ukraine and Georgia? I mean, uh, does Russia own Ukraine and Georgia? 
Uh, so when Ukraine and Georgia were deciding to join NATO, it is our relations with NATO. They can feel as far as they want, but it is like my ex-boyfriend will be jealous to my future husband. That is their problem. It is not our problem. No, it is unfortunately now our problems, but I mean that it is not our guilt. It's probably something that they need to go to the psychiatrist. But if we go to the Steinmeier formula, because it is more um, interesting now, uh, you are completely right. Uh, unfortunately, we noticed it for the last three years at least that uh, very often Russians are coordinating their ideas that they are throwing to the uh, um, resolution process in Transnistria and in Donbass. And uh, uh, they are, sometimes we saw, for example, propositions for Donbass that were proposed to Transnistria back in 1990s or in the beginning of the 2000s. So the exact, uh, those people who are dealing with the Transnistria conflict in Ukraine wrote already several articles wonderful about analyzing these parallels that happening all the time. With the Steinmeier formula, you are not paranoid because Ukrainian population started to go with no capitulation. What is the biggest problem? Uh, the biggest problem is that the formula itself uh, brings even more question marks than the answers. It is extremely vague. It is even more vague than the Minsk agreements. And the only idea why Ukrainian president agreed to it, because he really wants Normandy for meeting because of his personal uh, political ratings and ambitions, because the previous president couldn't meet with Putin, because of his ambition that he thinks that everybody like, considers me as a clown, as a comedian, but I can talk to Putin. So first, it is personal to him. Uh, and the second is that he thinks it is the only way to meet and finally uh, to talk on another level because Minsk is in stagnation. So unfortunately, this scenario is extremely favorable for Germany and France because they are already uh, tired of all this postponing of the meetings and they also hoped, okay, it's easier to press Ukraine to sign something like San Mario formula, then to press Putin finally to meet. You know, for how many times Kremlin was just declining the meeting that was proposed. That's why when you try to understand Zelensky standing about the uh, um, Donbass, um, fortunately or unfortunately, it is in the flux. There are certain red lines that he announced, and the last one was two days ago. By his representative, he finally said seven things. Uh, but at the same time, we still don't know what are the nuances of his, like, what are his future steps. Red lines are territorial integrity. Red line is the sovereignty. Red line is the elections only after security. Uh, red line is the withdrawal of the Russian forces from the Ukrainian territory. So all these things here naming, that is good. But it's always the question, okay, what is next? Special status for Donbass? What is in this special status? Yep. And many, many questions like amnesty, full amnesty, not full amnesty. So these questions, it seems to me they're, at least from my insights that I have from his team, they're still developing it. They still don't know whom to trust in it. And they're working by intuition, like what both our foreign partners and what Ukrainian population would accept as the certain compromises. Before or after, uh, it seems to me you can't make it before or after because Moldova is so complicated uh, and complex and long term, so it, it can't be that just tomorrow you sit and finally sign certain agreement. They also will go with a certain process, so it seems to me they will try to make it in parallel depending who will be the first one, Ukraine or Moldova, to go to some con uh, confessions or how you will name it. Great, okay. There's a question for you about values and interests. Very dangerous. Okay. Uh, with Russia, it's very easy. It is security. Uh, Turkey is member of NATO. That's it. In our region, it, it's clear. If you need security in our region, you should go to Russians. You really. What else? Iran, China. Israel, okay, but, but this is about cherry of the cake. Uh, if you need security, you go to Russia. That, that's, uh, uh, that's very clear in our region. Uh, I remember in this city, in 2008, in early April, President of Georgia at that time, Mr. Saakashvili, proclaimed that Georgia uh, is going to be member of NATO. 
exactly in four months, in August 2008, Russian tanks stopped in 40 kilometers from his capital. Very clear. So Russia for us is security. If you are in the region where you are Turkey from the west, uh, Azerbaijan from the east, and Nagorno-Karabakh, and the Georgia, which I told in my uh, presentation, uh, Iran and Georgia, it's only Jews. Russia is security. Europe. Europe is identity. Maybe in Europe they don't know, but Armenians are European nations. Uh, if you ask Armenians who you are wider than just your ethnic identity, they will, will say we are Europeans. And this choice, sometimes they talk about choice, which should be done by, by ours. Ours, I mean, not just uh, Armenians, uh, former Soviet people. You cannot do such kind of choice by signing a paper. It's not about organizations. It's not about Brussels. It's not about bureaucratic machines. It's about civilization and choice, which was, was done, if you would ask Armenia from the street, approximately from uh, Alexander the Great till, till Renaissance, a couple of thousand years. So you are part of this, uh, of this space. I teach, and my students, maybe more than half of them, speak English already better than Russian, which is absolutely, uh, in, in my generation, it, it was, I had my curriculum in Russian. For uh, Yerevan intelligentsia uh, of my age, Russian usually is not even a, a, a good known foreign language, it's one of the mother tongues. Now it's not the case. All of them want to go to the West. This program, that program, one week, one year, Poland, Romania, France, Netherlands, Great Britain, United States, New Zealand, doesn't matter. They want to do it. They feel themselves part of this type of society. They wish that. Uh, I don't remember for last 30 years a young person who wants to go to Chelyabinsk State University and maybe never will. It's not about good or bad. It's about feeling of population there. Uh, you can have brilliant relationships with Russia in, in Armenia. You can. But you cannot feel yourself Russian and finish it. You can have brilliant relations with Iran, but you cannot feel yourself Persian, American. You can't be European. If Italians are, if Portuguese are, if Romanians are, why, why, why not? So this is about identity, about culture, about orientation of people, even, even ordinary people in the street. Because when you Georgia open Paul. newspaper and you see European something, that means good. Not even printed or, I don't know, uh, produced in Europe. Something good. If they propose you something European, that means that this, this, this is uh, good. So this is about uh, identity. Okay. Great. Did you pick up on that uh, briefly? Yeah, I'll be quick. Also, maybe responding. I, I won't be this long. Um, uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's perfectly fine. I just uh, want to... Uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Iskandarian on security being our interest, but uh, you described that security more like a threat. Uh, so we are insecure. Uh, no, I mean, who, who is ready to sell cheaper weapons? That's a very quick question. Mr. Bolton, when he arrived in Yerevan after our revolution, he was suggesting to uh, change possibly and buy cheap uh, weapons from the US. And we were like, give us prices. Let's talk. No one is in reality, at the moment at least. When it comes to Europe, it is identity, I agree, but it's democracy as, as, as a fundament. And this revolution, which happened in Armenia, was and is about democracy and our aspirations of living in a democratic country. Uh, in, as a difference, the, the big difference, at least with the others, is that we're not, we don't want to choose sides by becoming a democratic country. And we are seeing a lot of problems here because we see a lot of double standards. I mean, oh yeah, you're democratic, but you're not anti-Russian enough, so not much, that much money. That's not fair. I mean, we were talking about democracy with our European, American, and other friends for years. 
And now we're finally a democracy, huh? I mean, we, there is ways to go until we have institutional, institutions and function, but we have made our choice. We are not going to become a dictatorship. Armenia has, in 2018, has made it very clear to the world. We will not have an Armen Bashi. And this needs to be marked, and I expect all the capitals that actually value and appreciate democracy to support our young democracy, to groom our young democracy, and to welcome us with open hands in the larger democratic family. Thank you. Great. Okay. Go ahead. Wait for the microphone. I think we've got time for, an, for another three, if, if, there's three, if there's three more. Uh, hello, I have two short questions. First is about Georgia. Uh, we see these evidences of Russian interference in Georgian internal politics. Don't forget to tell us who you are. Uh, this, this, uh, I'm sorry, I'm Valery Pasha, Community Watch Document D from uh, Moldova. Uh, they try to influence to uh, boost different social uh, pressures, tensions, conflicts, and so on, uh, interfere in politics in different ways. Uh, how do you see which is the final goal Russia is trying to achieve in Georgia? And second, very short, uh, do you think Putin would uh, let Armenia to not have an Armen Bashi? Okay, Any, who, who else would like to ask a question? I'm bidding for two more questions. Okay, no? Fine. Okay, fine, okay. So, uh, the question about Georgia and, fine, go ahead. Okay. Well, yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, what is the final goal of Putin? Uh, I don't think that uh, Russia realistically can think that they can have openly pro Russian government in Georgia. It's impossible. More than, uh, it's around 80% is, would be totally against it. And then this kind of government, even if it's installed forcefully, would not survive uh, for a long time. So the Russian, what Russians will try and then are trying uh, to do uh, with these all components of the hybrid war to have, uh, it's not only in Georgia, it's not specific to Georgia, it's specific to everywhere, especially in their neighborhood. They want their neighbors to be corrupt, uh, institutionally weak, run by clans, run by strongmen, and then this, they think that this is the surest way they can have real influence over that. So, but, uh, yeah, well, that has been proved many times, including not only in Georgia, but also in Ukraine. They, they really want they, them to be institutionally weak. Second component that I want to respond, that's the part of this Russian mythology about the, how, they, how Putin uh, is uh, being betrayed or the Russia was betrayed back in uh, Gorbachev's era as if someone promised them not to expand NATO and then violated that. A dozen of researches have been done on this issue and then nothing is proved. And then there is no even single piece of paper that says that someone then promised them not to expand NATO. And then I agree completely with Anna. They do not own Georgia and Ukraine. And the Georgia and Ukraine are sovereign countries, and the Georgia's and Ukraine's membership to NATO is a uh, business of Georgia and then and, and, uh, uh, Ukraine and plus NATO countries. So is uh, NATO really a threat to, to, to Russia? I don't think so. Even quite contrary. Uh, the, the Russia's most stable borders are with NATO countries. If you go to Norway, it, it is very visible. Estonians are protecting borders, not Russians are protecting. That, that is not, no one is protecting from that side. And uh, yeah, it's kind of nice to have NATO member as a neighbor. In our region, in South Caucasus, I mean, Azerbaijan is kind of, uh, you know, the neutral. Uh, while the technically, uh, oh, our friends, Armenians, but I have not seen in my life any Armenian that would say that the Georgia's NATO membership would represent any threat to Armenia. Never. Okay. We participated trainings in Georgia together with you and others. Completely they... agree. Even more, my friend Armenians, they see it as an opportunity for Armenia rather than any threat or risk. So. Those uh, uh, well uh, uh, issues related to um, uh, uh, 
uh, that uh, Russia feels threatened, that they are co completely groundless. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, democracy is, uh, oh, is uh, one of the most important components, and then strong, strong, strong institutions are one of the most, component, most important components that would take us there. And then that's, uh, that's what we should be focusing on primarily. Just Great. to follow you, Mr. Sikharidze, uh, uh, to, to continue, not, yeah, I'll get to the Bashi issue, uh, but, uh, but to, to continue, but by no means am I trying to support anyone here, but until, just to remind everyone, until 2001 and 2, Putin and Russia was interested in joining NATO. They were openly talking about this. So let's, uh, of course, different times. We can talk about this for years, but I mean, when we get to the point when we call each other threat or be feeling threatened, just about 20, exactly, just about 20 years ago, there was that missed opportunity. Now, with regards to, I will follow, like Ukraine and Georgia, Armenia is a sovereign country too. And we have proved it two years, a year and a half ago. I want this to be taken very seriously. Follow how Armenia is conducting its foreign policy now. Follow its new UN votes. Follow its behavior in different international, multilateral and bilateral arenas. If we want to have another lost story that is out there and don't want to make a success out of it, of course democracy spoilers are going to take advantage of us. But put us on the map of democratic states. Put us on the map of an interesting policy conducting countries. Make this a success story of trying to bring interests together, bridging interests together rather than dividing and or taking parties or sides and becoming a, another problem in the region that we have enough already. And I think Georgia and Armenia, which I call the Giorgio Armani, can become one of those great models where we have different directions and different things that we do in different places. It sounds cheesy, I know, but it's kind of cool. So, uh, but we are able to continue our bilateral free trade agreement. We are continuing to have different levels and layers of communication and cooperation from defense to security. That's one story we can talk about. That's another. I w I'll just give one more example and I'll finish it here. Uh, I've been living between Georgia and Armenia for the last five years, and last year alone I've traveled 48 times. I crossed the border 48 times, I just looked at my stamps. And I can tell you a very clear difference from the passport control of the Georgian side before and after the revolution. I would be received with a lot more respect by my Georgian colleagues. I think there is a lot of excitement in Georgia about what happened in Armenia in sense of the democratic transformation. And I think it's a great opportunity and a chance and a moment for us to actually find ways to cooperate and go deeper together. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Well, I think on, on, on that note, it's been, it's been just over an hour and I think everybody is exhausted, but uh, it's been an extremely productive panel, an extremely productive day and two days. So I'd like to say thank you to our panel, thank you to the audience for bearing with us to such, so late in the conference and uh, thank you to Aspen and to uh, GMF. Um, but Alina, is anybody else I need to say thank you to or oh, we'll you will do that? We'll take care of this, don't worry. Thank you team for your moderation. Um, and thank you everybody for being with us for, for so long. I did have a little bit of a spiel on everything that was discussed and the conclusions of it. I won't read it because everybody's tired um, and we'll put it in a, in a thank you letter to everybody as Ciprian suggested. There is only one conclusion which I want you all to take with you from this conference. There has not been any manal. We had females, we had women on each and every panel of this conference, and I think this, this is one of the big successes of the, um, of the meeting. <laughs> and we will meet again next year. We will meet again in March for the uh, Bucharest Security, uh, Security Forum. We do expect as many of you as possible to come and attend this event. Thank you all of the speakers. They were not only very good, but extremely, extremely, extremely passionate. Um, so thank you everybody and thank you all for your patience and for your resilience. And Ciprian, please join, join me in thanking everybody. And you can see how the convergence of interest is working very nicely with the two organizations. Yeah. Thank you. In the morning, uh, we promise you that we will have, including today, uh, very intense discussions. And uh, I hope you will agree that uh, today uh, the panelists, the conversations, uh, were in this uh, uh, sense. Uh, I, I would like at the end to thanks to all our partners, institutional, media, uh, 
strategical partners, glorious partners, to our sponsors that make this possible, this event possible. And uh, for sure, we need to, to thank you to all persons that supported us, the volunteers, the GMF team, and Aspen Institute team. And I hope you will uh, join me congratulating the persons that for a few days work to this event. Thank you and all the best and see you to our next uh, event. Sorry, I didn't mean to, but I did. Um, I do want to thank Nick Chajuana for all the help that he has been putting into starting this event, creating this event, working uh, close with the, with the team uh, to, the, to the organization of it. I don't know if this is live stream. I don't think Mircha has enough time to, to watch us, but I want to thank him for, for, for his contribution.